<laughs> I I feel kind of bad because I've kind of sailed through it. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. I feel I fine. Would, I wouldn't feel too bad about that. <laughs> I feel uh... absolutely fine. Um, all it did was um, it gave me this very strange, flighty, floaty feeling of not being quite connected to anything. Oh, it's so a standard. Yeah, I, well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm not sure. The thing is, I can't determine whether that was chemical or whether that was psychological. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was right. that um, was that just a, a general sense of euphoria? Mm, yeah. After a year like this, how do you even separate those? Uh, yeah, absolutely, anymore? absolutely. Yeah. I think um, what is required after these two years and this experience is some serious insight, both as individuals and as a culture, as a nation. You know, okay. uh, as a society, we need to turn our gaze inward a little bit and look at how we self-identify you know how we define and because i i'm finding myself in very strange places as a result of this mm. you know psychologically and internally i I've, i'm all over the place at the moment yeah i'm certainly planning on calling a wide-ranging and urgent inquiry into me as, <laughs> as quickly as possible <laughs> <laughs> once they finish with david cameron they can, uh, they can uh, <laughs> of course the uh, the net result of that is that nothing changes of course well, that's, um, that's, that's why I'm hiring them, George. Right, <laughs> George, right. Nothing I don't want to change is done. myself. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That, that Cameron thing's unbelievable. Uh, I, at this point, I, I, I am not surprised by anything. <laughs> I, I consider myself reasonably unsurprisable when it comes mm. to the state of British politics. That said, that said, I'm sure there are some new depths that it hasn't plumbed yet that it will, it will plummet to. In yeah. the not too distant future, I've no doubt, you know, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's the the unending and consistent atrocities uh, of the Tory party, which are just too many and too consistent to catalogue at this point, mm. or whether it's Keir Starmer visiting and promoting a rancidly homophobic church. What on earth was that? I don't and I really don't know, you know, like trying to give everyone involved the benefit of the doubt as much right. as possible. Where is the research there? I mean, I, I, I don't. I honestly don't know at this point. I honestly, with him, I don't know. He seems to be this strange, unknown quantity. Where I, I don't. I sincerely don't understand where his loyalties lie or what his overarching agenda actually is. Mm. So I, I don't know. Is he? Is it a? Is it a calculated move? That's that's what I find myself thinking. Is he trying to? appeal to, to sort of test the waters with a more conservative Labour base mm. I don't know I, or is it just rank f stupidity uh, I, I tend to go with incompetence and sort of you know yeah. things falling through the cracks especially when a lot of home workings involved and stuff uh -huh. but I, I mean it, you know because obviously you'd expect you know I imagine there are dozens of people working on his team who whose uh -huh. job is to look into this stuff. Right, and right. Some corners get cut sometimes, but um, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I'm not discounting your slightly more. Um, There's a more paranoid. No, no, it's fine yeah. to call it paranoid because it absolutely is. But at this point, I feel so paranoid about the state of British politics. <laughs> um, what what leapt into my mind was, could you imagine if this were Jeremy Corbyn? So mm. this would have been front page news. It would have been all over the the, the BBC for for at least a week. Mm. Yes, definitely. It would have been everywhere, and it hasn't actually been mentioned in the mainstream press at all. Mm. The only place you would know about it is if you go to Twitter or if you go to Facebook or whatever. Yeah, my, I was talking to Kit about this, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. uh, in, including in bits that didn't make it into the latest episode we did together. But um, I was, you know, and he's he's got his own take on it, and um, I, I mean, I've I've shared some of his views on it. I, I think I've still got a bit of um, this really does make me sound like a naive kind of hostage, but I, I, I am. <laughs> what I am trying to do is give the Starmer team the benefit of the doubt, just uh -huh. when it comes to election winning stuff, yeah, until yeah. at least these uh, may re may results, you know, because mm -hmm. um, because I think I think a lot of people when they were critiquing the Starmer project from a, a variety of angles last year were kind of forgetting that we hadn't had that vent of May 2020 you know mm -hmm. as, as a at least as an initial canary down the mine kind of indicator of right, how right. this was going and I think I think there's almost I, I've got kind of a <laughs> no, it is hopelessly naive, probably, <laughs> sen sense of almost like a uh, party member fair play in the sense of giving them right. a crack at it yeah know? seeing how it how it pans out I mean my exactly. 
my uh, the thing is I my approach to British politics uh, for the longest time has always been nihilism it's always been a state of nihilism um, simply because I don't believe the systems are fit for purpose I don't think the traditions that they're based on are fit for mm. purpose um, the best we can always do is compromise at the moment even if even if it were someone as seemingly progressive as jeremy corbyn or whatever you know the most we can do within the current traditions and assumptions is compromise um there's no utopianism there's no like there's no notion of tomorrow in british politics there's always this state of we just want to maintain things yeah or we want to bring them back from the brink and for me that is just a no-go I don't want that. You know, that, that doesn't <laughs> represent me at all. Mm. I want a situation that's going to look forward, that actually is look, that actually has some notion of what shape tomorrow can be, because mm. I don't think the society into which I was born is good enough. Yeah, well, I think that's something probably a bunch of us can agree on. And actually, well, one of my problems with the Corbyn era, I thought, was that it was a bit too heady with nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that was one thing, and actually, I, I remember. Particularly, this isn't me trying to be wise after the event or anything, because I, yeah, you know, yeah. I hoped I hoped for the best as a member and campaigner in 2019. Of but, course, but I did. I do remember, you know, particularly because the 2019 election was happening at such a weird time. It had a sort of such an end of an era feeling at the end of in December 2019. Yeah, of I, re- course. I remember thinking, and I think they kind of they kind of just recycled that election, the 2017, you know, for the many kind of thing, didn't they? Insofar as there was a unified slogan uh-huh. uh, for the campaign. I really thought, and this before the election um, disaster, I, I, I thought it's so weird that they're not trying to peg themselves to the fact that a decade is about to start. Right. Like it's so, it's so strange. Like, yeah, and I, I, I was just spitballing with some friends in the pub back then. I was like, you know, new decade, new start. Mm-hmm. You know, there you get something like that. You know, something. It's not quite, you know, the white heat of Harold Wilson or whatever. You know, but it, it's kind of, it's getting at that. It's getting at that. Right. I mean, stuff. even uh, Blair's project, as as horrific as it ultimately ended up being. Uh, had that quality about it, didn't it? It really did fasten onto the notion of this being a new tomorrow, of it being mm-hmm. progressive and forward thinking, of it being the end of a very dark era, which of course it wasn't. But that was one of the, it was one of the themes that the campaign rode on, mm. and it worked. You know, it certainly worked. And the problem is, Labour end up in this kind of. Um... I don't want to say comfort zone because that makes me sound like a kind of you know critique of the party's aims in general, but you know mm-hmm. they, they end up in this space where um, they kind of are more comfortable in some respects being the small C conservative party in the sense yes. that they are the, they're, they're the party to defend the gains and uh, of back <clears throat> forty five and afterwards yeah. and you know the, 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 to, to fight a defend a desperate defensive rear guard against in, further enroachments on them. That's it, it. That's the problem, that's, isn't it? It kind of makes the them picture, reactionary, you know? doesn't it? You know. It, it, it innately i think and, and it's it's kind of um you know i mean I, I i do despair sometimes actually george but i do <laughs> you know you know when when polls and this ebbs and flows but when polls sometimes show the tories as nearly as mm-hmm. trusted with things like the nhs as, as labor right. i think that's that's almost when i'm going to start packing up the bunting and going home you know because that's right. just yeah i don't know i don't know where to take it from i there. mean it's an interesting thing isn't it because politics dominates so much of our discourses and because it's established itself as like the the principal discourse in our culture there is the sense that if you're politically nihilist which i am i'm unashamedly politically nihilist in the current climate um that you are nihilist in every conceivable way which is not the case there is there, there is basis for hope in many many areas uh and basis for exploration of new things in humanity it's just i don't think that it can happen in those discourses not as they are Mm. not as they are i, I have think... trouble with uh yeah so you go no through. no go on no, I, I was just gonna say uh, you know loads of things about the starmer project disconcert people mm-hmm. in all kinds of directions that, you know, <clears throat> and i think ultimately the big question is just you know will it work well mm-hmm. that's a, a question um as you say that you know it working might not be enough in itself right, um, right. but uh but i i, I you know because of the death of um prince philip um mm-hmm. a week ago i'm, I'm a I'm not. I wouldn't say I was a rabid, but I am a committed Republican. Mm-hmm. And I and I I was reading a. I think it was the Sunday Times. You know, kind of puff piece with with Keir Starmer, where he was. You know, he was doing he was doing all the leader of the opposition stuff that you meant to do yeah. in those sort of pieces and being lovely. You know, being being cuddly and basically doing a, an informal Desert Island Discs type interview right. and all that, and which is fine. 
Um, but I was, uh, it was just, it was, he was talking about the monarchy and, and, you know, saying that, you know, saying all the things that I guess you have to say in this moment where you like, you know, it, it, I think, what, what was his line? Something like the British people's faith has never failed, has oh, never That was it, never wavered. been stronger. It's never wavered in the royal yeah. family. And I'm like, does, the, the, the English Civil War wasn't that long ago, historically, you know. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. looking at it on a particular scale, it actually wasn't that terribly long ago. Um, yeah. And that's before you even consider the the, the rising and the escalating anti-royalist sentiments mm. in certain demographics, you know? Um, but just on a, on a personal level, like, the, de- the, the reason I kind of, you know, when I heard of the death of Prince Philip, I was sort of like, ah, oh, it's because I knew I, would, I was going to be forced into a position where I was endlessly going to have to defend myself against mm. the impositions of people who want me to mourn, mm. who yeah. want me to falsely, by the way, express concern. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a you know, a sort of edge lordy, um, oh, I, I don't care kind of way. I mean it in a very sincere way. Yeah. I yeah. don't care. <laughs> I, I actually yeah, yeah. can't. Not as a posture, just you know. I can't make myself feel what I don't. And I, I find it amazing that to so much of this country, in its, frankly, in its hysteria, in its total pants on head, tinfoil hat, hysteria that is not a statement of position it's an assault mm, yeah yeah indifference is is a different indifference offends a lot of people doesn't it mm, it really is. and I, I you know i can i can sort of expostulate on why it offends them um and i imagine it's because it shines a light on on that very hysteria on the fact that these reactions are being cultivated by media they're being prescribed by a wider culture and they're not sincere i don't believe them (laughs) i simply (laughs) don't believe them i don't know how you can possibly mourn for one thing, a man you've never met. For another, a man who has lived his life in obscene luxury and has had the best of everything as a matter of his birth. You know, I, I, second, you know, third of all, a man who was a curmudgeonly old racist, an, an awful human being by all accounts. So, yeah, well, it's interesting because you know, people roughly our age, we've we've got a certain media um, profile of Prince Philip, you know, just from the, the time that we've been alive. And mm-hmm. um, but, I, but I was actually wondering. It's funny because I've been. Um, I've been rewatching quite a lot of the sort of Matt Smith era of Doctor Who recently. Ah, yes. Um, particularly, the, I'm actually on the sort of latter bits of it now, you know, the kind of um, uh, cl- early Clara bits. Yeah, uh, yeah. Before, before the 50th and all that. And I was actually thinking, uh, not an original thought, I'm sure, but I was just thinking, I wonder how many people are a bit younger than us um, haven't really had much ex- exposure to Philip at all, even in media right. stuff. And it's and it's and they're what they're mostly doing is the guy that Matt Smith played and the guy, what's it, Tobias Menzies played in The Crown. Yeah, has died. Right, right, yeah. You know. Um that's that's a fair point. I mean, I think there is a generational thing here, definitely. You know, I, I think connection to the royal family and regard for the royal family is something that is going to inevitably be stronger in older generations. Mm. Inevitably. Um it's something that younger generations will question just by its very nature, you know, why? What's what's the point? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 my, you know, my, my parents were not royalists, but no, you know, I, 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 but, but they mine. don't, you know, they, they're also not rabidly, rabidly anti-royal. You know, no, they, it's, not, it's not core of their politics. Um, my grandparents tended to sort of like them. I think mm-hmm. in general, you know, they, I mean, again, they weren't. Um, uh, mild, mild uh, diversion here. Like, my, my, it's funny actually how, how conservatives can be can have some interesting turns in their politics. My my granny, my Scottish granny, was um, <laughs> my mum's mum was um, a conservative, like from the the Second World War onwards. Basically, right. she, she was a, a proper kind of Scottish Tory before it was cool, <laughs> so to speak, uh, and didn't really waver in that as she got older. But she. Um, she really, really didn't like Winston Churchill. Right. And it's because she'd uh, grown up in um, as a Scottish mining town called Kelty. Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so they they um they had a lot of left wing politics coming out of Kelty and out of you know sort of the mining towns of Fife then and and even later life conservatives like my granny mm-hmm. had very little time for Winston Churchill because what they were thinking of was was Home Secretary Winston Churchill and right you know scourge of the miners. Well, he was the devil, know. wasn't he? To the mining communities, he was the devil. Um, my great was it, would it have been my great yeah my great grandfather was shot on his orders. 
mm. which is kind of interesting. Right. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, like yourself, my uh, on my father's side, my grand my grandparents were were miners, you know. Um, so the anti-Tory sentiment was was strong. I think my granny joked, well, my granny didn't joke very often, but I think she, she did have kind of a dry wit. And I think once I said something like, you know, as a kid, I was like, you know, but, he, you know, he won, he won us the war, though, didn't he? Oh. Or something. And, my, and my granny was like, well, that makes us even. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, she's like, she wasn't going to give any credit to him she was like you know that's 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 we're back to zero now, no it's you know? a fair point it's a fair point and of course it's salient in the current cultural climate because of course we have this this bizarre resurgence of mythologization of winston churchill mm. which including is, in the crown of course well yeah and it's totally a historical it's totally a historical. Most of the people who actually vouchsafe it, by the way, have never picked up a history book at all since, like, GCSE level. Mm. Uh, and certainly know nothing about the man or about World War Two beyond what culturally prescribed myth tells us. Because the moment you go and actually read any kind of biography that isn't a hagiography of Winston Churchill, it becomes really apparent that that, that very, you know, that very response, ah, but he won us the war, is not true <laughs> well yeah I, I wasn't going to go into that <laughs> it's yeah, just no, totally no. false you know it's totally yeah. wrong um it's it's a simplification obviously i mean of course you have the base assumption which is also false in the statement which is that we won the second world war when mm. it would be actually historically more accurate to say we survived yeah 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 I think it would be a more mature conception of the Second World War as well if we said we survived more we, often. Uh, you know? I think so. I think so. I mean, the it seems the more I read about World War II from actual historians, you know, from people who just want to document the event, um, who don't have like a political axe to grind one way or the other, it becomes apparent that what we're told when we're what we're told throughout our childhoods, you know, through our education systems, through our culture, so much of it is wrong. Or distorted or misconceived. So this notion, like, we as British people are programmed with this notion that it was this binary war that other countries just happened to be involved in, in like little, in little areas. But it was between Germany and the UK, and the UK was the plucky little island against the, the great Hun, you know? And mm. of course, it's simply not true. It's not true if you read, for example, if you bother to go and read the journals of the the higher Nazis, people like Goebbels and like and like Hitler, they didn't really give much of a crap about the UK. To be perfectly honest, insofar as they were concerned, it was it was a pathetic little island that was going to be destroyed. You know, mm. um, their big target was was the Soviets. You know. Well, yeah, as as as, as it would have to be. <laughs> um, well, yeah. well, clearly, you know, clearly. Um, it, if, it, if it was a war between anyone, it was a war between <laughs> Russia and Germany. You know, that's the big that's the big conflict. Uh, the UK happened to survive and make contributions to the effort. Mm. Significant I, I think, contributions. I, I think it's complicated, isn't it? Because I, I think I think there's something about the British, like the modern British psyche, which if, on some level finds it difficult to accept that kind of you might say dismissively walk on role in World War Two. Mm-hmm. As a more of a proportional kind of truth, yeah. But I, but I think it's weird actually, isn't it? Because we, we are kind of in some ways we are, you know, I'll make a generalisation here. We as as a nation are mm. comfortable sometimes with that that role of kind of plucky bit part, you mm-hmm. know, like in, in American movies and stuff. I'm thinking, you know, right, the, the, right. You know, the British guy is the comic relief more often than not, you know, that yes. kind of thing. Um, but I, but I don't know. I think it's it's almost like we just can't. But we need the Second World War still, I think. We need to clutch that to our chest. I think, I mean, you know, uh, I, I, I don't feel qualified to make this diagnosis as such, but it is like a narrative that I, I, I sometimes chew over in my own mind. I, I do think sometimes can an entire nation be traumatised? And I'll, I'll, I don't think that our nation, along with many others, ever recovered from the First World War and the Second World War. I think mm. since that period, it has been one of nothing but culturally pervasive collective trauma. And part of that, the nation's defense mechanism against that is to make it this matter of mythology, of identity. You know, as, as ironically, individual abuse victims and trauma victims often do. It becomes part of the set of the identity. Mm. I, well, think, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, I sound like I'm obsessed with the crown at the moment, but this is a, it, it's it's an interesting thing if you to take the royal family as kind of a 
a central talisman of Britishness, you know, mm-hmm. certainly the, the Elizabethan age, the second Elizabethan age that we're living through still. Right. Um, it's interesting that they're, they're sort of trauma is is formed in those war years as well as in those pre-war years of you know the, the the kind of you know at least what the crown is it likes to portray as like the kind of central windsor obsession of the abdication and mm-hmm. being the opposite of the abdication and you know and you've got interesting ties up there of you know edward the eighth as being an unsuitable monarch partly because he well mostly because he left but also mm-hmm. partly because he was and they certainly play on this in the crown you know that he was tied up with the, the nazi regime into in an uncomfortable way and right you know we, we need to not be that you know and it's it's kind of I think, not to sidetrack too much, but I, I just think the monarchy is part of that. Um, I, guess, I guess, like, the, the monarchy had its own, this sounds really excusing them, you know, but the monarchy had their own <laughs> form of trauma. Um, yeah. L- light though it was, compared to most people's. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, know. it's a, it's a difficult thing, isn't it? Because, you know, you think of the monarchy as, like, this monolithic institution, which it is, don't get me wrong. But that there is, you know, the, certainly the, the liberal lefty in me, really wants to see the human as well it wants to see the humanity it, it, it wants to see the individual humans born into that engine as victims in and of themselves they're victims in a very different way obviously yeah. um which ironically we're seeing now of course with the whole um, harry and megan thing yeah um, well they're all they're all victims by dint of being there that's always been my thing of it like is it's they they are not they shouldn't. That's why I always try and focus my rage on because mm. it is often rage. Is yeah. it, it's not. It's not that. It's genuinely not their fault. You know. It, it's, it's no. It, no. It's, it's not. Their, it's their fault to the extent that anyone could wake up one day and say, "I'm not doing this anymore." You know. So, so yes. it's so it's that they have that. You know. I'd say like five percent of responsibility in their own mm-hmm. human lives so that they're not. They wake up every day and don't do that. Mm-hmm. But 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 I, but it, you know. I don't know how I'd act if I was born into that situation. You know. It's right. ridiculous. You know. I, I was. I wrote a piece online, I think it was about five, six years ago now, but it still largely reflects what I think about this, which is just like, can you imagine if we if we still, you know, and obviously this was the case throughout most of human history, if we still had casts for, like, toilet cleaners. Right. And, you know, the son of a toilet cleaner had to become a toilet cleaner eventually. And, right, you know, yeah. had to wait 30 years to get the toilet brush and then pass that on to their son or daughter. And then, you know, if, if we did that and looked at it, we'd, it would be clear madness, wouldn't it? Or at least injustice. Right. Right, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it's it's the way we allow for enshrined madnesses because they are part of tradition, because they are part of what has always been. I think part of what drives so many people towards sort of more left-wing or um, more deviant or anarchistic thought in these regards is when they start to realise those madnesses, when something happens or some situation occurs that pushes you outside of the fishbowl a little bit and allows you to look in. And you start to see the the madnesses, you know, the the little diseased engines that have just always been there, mm. and have just been allowed to grow more and more diseased as time has gone on, rather than being fixed or challenged or changed. Well, did you joke on Twitter this week that you? Um, it's funny to hark back to our Golden Gas episode. But I, I was, you, uh, actually, I was just about to do it because the, it, it kind yeah. of does. Yeah, the Golden Gas is a great satire on that very notion, isn't it? Yeah, and you, uh, didn't you say something on Twitter about you, you'd never felt more like Steer Pike than yeah. this week? Yeah, it's absolutely true. It really, it does. Yeah, and, and I don't mean in the sense like that he, you know, in his, his in terms of his hyper competence or anything like that, because that's definitely not part of me. Um, but in the sense that he is the bit of grit, mm. in the sense that he isn't what he's supposed to be, and as a result of that, can see those little insanities. I like that. I like that the uh, aspect of Steer Pike's character you're keen to distance yourself from George's is competent. Well, yeah, because <laughs> I mean, yeah, absolutely, because he is hyper competent, isn't he? I mean, he is the cleverest person in the room always and forever with the possible exception maybe of uh, gertrude Mm. you know Mm. gertrude's intelligence is of an entirely other type it's 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 not as scalpel precise as steer pikes is it's more monolithic isn't it? it's glacial but she gets there in the end and when she bends her mind to things gertrude can move mountains you know it's it, it's funny casting uh, uh, slightly ahead to our, our topic. I don't know when we're going to land on it, but um, mm. I uh, I remember when we were talking about Gorman Gaston on, on on my show that uh, we we sort of said that some of the environments in it, you know, visually on the BBC adaptation were a little bit video gamey. Yeah, you know, yeah. Steer bike climbing up the rooftops and things like that. So I think we, what we should do is uh, after this we should um, somehow learn how to build an Amiga game and make <sighs> the Amiga game of Gorman Gaston. Jesus, you know. 
that might not be a terrible thing, you know. I mean, obviously, the, the temptation to do a video game... I mean, how the hell would you even do that? A video game of Gormenghast. The only, the only thing I could think of, the only way I could think of doing that is by making it like an open-world RPG. Mm. Where you where you have Gormenghast itself as a living environment, and you could wander around from room to room, from tower to tower. You could basically follow the paths of the characters. So you could follow the path of Steerpike from the kitchens as he climbs up and ascends into the the higher towers to Fuchsia's dormitory. Um, you could follow maybe uh, Prune Squalor, you know, um, mm. as he as he moves sort of. Prune Squalor is an interesting character because he moves in between different areas of Gormenghast. You know, he's definitely one of the more privileged characters of Gormenghast, but at the same time has a kind of pragmatic connection to the working castes of Gormenghast. He's mm. almost like the go-between between the the working the working castes and the the upper classes, the aristocracy. I mean, you can imagine it like a sort of classic RPG in some senses, can't you? Because like, if you, I mean, I know we're being slightly fatuous here, but if you were to play as Steerpike, um, mm. you know, you would you'd be given loads of missions, wouldn't you? Loads yeah. of like side quests, and you know, Prune Scholar would need you to take something to the school, or yeah. you know, that or you know, Gertrude would need you to go and fetch one of her cats that had got lost. Or yeah, something like they'd that, even be know? like little mini games. So like, if you were if you were Steerpike when he was situated with the Prune Squallers, you could have like little mini games where you have to prepare the medicines for everyone, and mm. you can actually make choices as to what you know which characters maybe you start poisoning maybe you could change the story a little bit i mean i know that in the book yes. it's a little more ambiguous as to whether he actually does it's implied more than stated i mean in in the in the adaptation it's absolutely stated he definitely poisons nanny slag um but that is it's more a matter of implication in the book you could do a fun thing with Steerpike where, because, um, you know, previously we talked about um, Titus alone, which, you know, mm. you've, you've, you've read, and obviously that, that chronicles Titus going outside outside the castle and into the weird, strange oh, zones God, beyond it. Such a weird damn book, that one. Yeah, 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 but you could do a thing, you could do a fun thing with a video game where um, Steerpike himself leaves the confines of the castle wow. and you see how Steerpike reacts to some of those situations in a different way to Titus. God almighty. Steerpike outside of Gormenghast would be a very interesting quantity indeed. Um, I shudder to think. It's so weird because he is so tied to Gormenghast, despite his deviance from it. You know, he is in many respects. He always uh, an analog. I always think of is uh, Neo in the Matrix. You know, in the Matrix mythology, how Neo is revealed to not actually be a deviant principle as he is at the beginning. He's actually a functionary of the wider system. Mm -hmm. He's there to balance the uh, the equation. That's kind of how I see Steerpike in many respects. He thinks of himself as the revolutionary, when in fact what he actually is is kind of the inevitable product of Gormenghast and its oppressions. And mm. what he serves to do is refresh the system by challenging it. I mean, he does come that close to ending it, or at least to changing it so much that it feels like an ending. But imagine if Steerpike did establish himself as the new emperor of Gormenghast. I mean, what really would change? I mean, obviously it would be more pragmatic. A lot of all of that nonsense that Sourdust and Barkentine are interested in, you know, the uh, the old traditions of Gormenghast, all of that would be out the window. Um, well, I, I think Steerpike might keep some of that on as long as he didn't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, as long as he could subcontract that stuff out. Yes, you know? of course. But I get the impression with Steerpike, everything would be boiled down to its essentials. Everything would be about function. Um, I could also imagine him being a rather bellicose and warlike leader. You know, I can imagine him wanting to spread whatever regime he establishes in Gormenghast to other kingdoms and other which countries. Le which, which leads to the question, what's next to Gormenghast? Eh? You know? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. The Thai War and Narnia, that's the I second... Mean the weird Second thing book. is even Titus alone which goes out into the world you know there are other cities there are other states doesn't really explain that in any great detail you would not there's not like a map in Titus alone where it explores these other areas in relation to Gormenghast the whole feeling of the thing is feverish it's like a dream you could do a fun thing like uh, set in like contemporary London where um, uh, you know like uh, you're just in some like part of the east end of London or something and the, the, the army of Gormenghast just emerges out of an alleyway and tries to invade <laughs> London you know what would just, it even look like I mean like <laughs> just Gorman... one guy I reckon like, like TikTok from Return to World <laughs> right and you get the impression it wouldn't be that efficient as well I mean there isn't much in the way of like soldiery in Gormenghast. They do exist. They are there. But 
they don't really do a great deal. Certainly as Gormengas stands, as Steerpike is making his ascent through it, the soldiery are ceremonial. Like so much, <laughs> like so much else in Gormengast. They don't really have that much of a function or a purpose, really. Yeah, yeah, it's another thing that makes the whole the whole sort of setup of it feel just so so strange and so sort of ersatz and so, you know, weirdly codified but but well, dead. You know? You've got entire cultures, like subcultures in Gormengast, whose only purpose is entirely aesthetic and ceremonial. So you've got the, the, the lowest of the low, which are the bright carvers. Their entire culture, they live in mud huts outside of the, the castle itself, and their reverence for the groans borders on the religious and they don't question anything their entire purpose is just to go through the motions of making these carvings that mm. they present on particular days and some of them are accepted and then they end up being stowed away in the hall of bright carvings and never seen again and others are rejected in which instance they're burned and then they go back and do it again well that's almost like going back to the modern british monarchy that's that's almost like a, a very early on parody of what the modern windsor kind of monarchy is like isn't it because yeah. it is a, it is a constant parade you know i mean i was looking this is not to do the thing because a lot of monarchists do the thing of oh look how hard they work you know oh, I, I, I hate I, that <laughs> I, 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 I get the point I yeah. get the reality of that that's not the point at all and in, no. and in a way if you go back to my caste system thing it's it's an argument against because why are we making these people do all this shit mm -hmm. um, but 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 yeah it's, it's sort of sort of Gormengast is like the um, apotheosis of the kind of um, you know the Princess Margaret judging a women's institute uh, bakery competition or something mm -hmm. isn't it you know just just that on loop forever yeah you know? forever and ever and ever yeah absolutely what i find interesting is you get more of it, it is certainly in the bbc adaptation but you get more of a sense of it in the book which is that the individuals within the system regardless of which caste or position they're born to it drives them all mad Mm. Every single one of them. I mean, some of them more overtly than others, but Sepulcrave is the obvious one. I mean, he literally loses his mind. Um, and yet he is the highest of the high. He is the most privileged. He is the, he is the grown, you know, he is the, the emperor of Gormengast. And he is well named. He is utterly miserable. And the book makes a point of uh, stating that this melancholia... Uh, that just overtakes him in the end and causes his personality to, to disassociate to the point whereby he believes himself to be an owl. Um, it's been there throughout his life. It's mm. not a new thing. That's the way he is. That's his mien. and it's his demeanour. Fuchsia. I, I, also, I also see him as sort of like, a, you know, Titus if he... If he got trapped and couldn't escape you know yeah, like exactly. kind of kind of the way a young man like titus curdles into an old man like sepulchrave you know yeah it's absolutely true that's that's kind of the ultimate fate of titus if he didn't leave mm. um it's the crushing of all essential spirit isn't it the the destruction of any dream at all yeah. this is what you are this is what you do and that's the end of it the only thing sepulchrave has solace in is his books in his library and of course steerpike <laughs> does that quite dramatically yeah, yeah, that's uh, which is particularly cruel, actually, isn't it? Even if you it just is. get to know that character. I mean, it's not, it, you know, all fairness to Steer Pike, it's not his intention to do that. Um, his intention is to make a theatre of it. He doesn't realise the library is as significant to Sepulcrave as it is. What he thinks is he will set a light to the library and then swoop in and save them, and that will bring him to the attention of Sepulcrave. Mm -hmm. as the hero you know yeah because you'd probably you'd probably rather be dealing with him directly than gertrude really wouldn't you? well well the thing is with gertrude is she would probably if she if she dealt with steer pike to any great degree she would know mm. she would probably see there are a couple of characters in the book who would probably see who he is uh one of them is gertrude the other is kida the uh, uh titus's uh, nursemaid from the uh, the Bright Carvers, who doesn't have much of a role in the BBC adaptation. Much of her story is kind of cut out of it for pacing reasons. But she is very like Steerpike in many respects. She's born to this caste system where she's supposed to be a particular thing and act in a particular way and doesn't. She refuses it, she flouts it, she, she does very often the very contrary of what she's supposed to do. And so is herself an outcast, you know? 
maybe in our video game version, Kida is one of the mm. early boss battles. You know, wow, she does karate yeah. in our version. Well, she. Uh, the funny thing is, they never encounter one another. Not ever. Kida and Steerpike never get the chance to meet one another. If she did, I get the impression she would know what he was from from the get go, from the instant. The thing with Kida is she's so human. She's so passionately connected to humanity. She's got this sort of vitality, this life force, which manifests in incredible empathy for everyone she meets. So when she meets Nanny Slag, for example, she she gets her measure immediately. She knows how to handle her. When she meets Titus, she knows how to handle him. Um, if she encountered Steerpike, she would know. I think the actress in the BBC adaptation just doesn't get a lot of time to do it in, but she kind of conveys a bit of that when she's dealing with Nanny Slag, and she's kind yeah. of she, she kind of both can't hack some of Nanny Slag's imbecilities, but yeah. she also kind of she also like deflects her nicely and kind of calms her down when she needs yeah. to. Yeah, I mean, you know. it, it's quite brilliant in many respects. Kida, Kida understands. She understands how people work, and she understands what people are expressing. So she knows, you know, Nanny Slag's constant refrain of "Oh, my weak heart" and all this nonsense. Mm. She's not got a weak heart. She's fine. It's an expression of a general anxiety. Mm. Her great fear is, of course, that she's getting old, and she's going to be ejected from her position, which kind of means being ejected from life. Yeah. In Gormenghast, yeah, yeah. when you have no more function to perform, um, your life is over. As you see with Flay, who basically who basically loses a job and as a result is a hermit. You know? Yeah, I mean, and Flay, yeah. for I mean, that moment, it's really awful in the in the BBC adaptation. I think Christopher Lee plays it gorgeously. You know, when when Gertrude she says to him this castle ejects you the look of absolute it's not even horror it's not trauma it's something he can't even process mm. because flay is one of the most functionable characters in the book and in the story his whole personality is about serving lord sepulchrave it's all he's ever done did they ever go into um? This you might know a bit more of this because you've been rereading it recently and you know the book better than me. But um, did they ever go into like where like what where Flay is from? Is is he just the son of another butler? Yeah. He's the son of another butler. Yeah, he's, he's his whole family have done that. They've served the grown, and he's been doing it since uh, he and Seppel Crave were kids. You know mm. that's been his whole function forever. I think um, he went to the same college. You know, they sent him away briefly to college with Igor from Count Ducula. You know. <laughs> they've, got they a very, they've got a very similar demeanor. <laughs> got a very similar demeanor. The only other part of Flay, uh, Flay's character, of course, is his um, his enmity with Swelter, mm. which is so passionate. Yeah, and where did so, that come from? I want, I want to see the prequel of that. You know? It's well, the funny thing is, it, you never really learn where it comes from. You even in the books, you don't learn where it comes from. There's just this like. It's an automatic and visceral antipathy. They hate one another. They are just the antithesis of one another. And there's no good guy or bad guy in it. They're both as bad as one another. I mean, Flay Kinda, constantly yeah. undermines Swelter uh, and insults him and even, like, smacks him at several junctures. Uh, and Swelter... It's got an element of uh, Quark and Odo to it, um, <laughs> as, as an old DS9 fan. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> It's there's like no rhyme or reason to it. You get the impression that Flay just regards Swelter as grubby and dirty mm. and unworthy. And just sort of salacious in a way that he isn't, you know, like yeah. he's, he's actually he's, he's, he's as you say sort of earthy and kind of you know, obviously we, we talked on the episode before, you know, about how he uh, Swelter takes pleasure in a whole bunch of stuff he, he really, really shouldn't. But oh, he, yeah. he but you know, he, he does have that side to that sort of alive side to himself that Flay seems to have completely subsumed by duty you know that's a fair point actually because Flay is essentially like a corpse he's he's essentially a walking corpse until he's ejected from the castle he's got no personality beyond he's like a robot he serves the groans and that's it there's nothing else to him but the ejection of him from the castle brings out something else yeah, I, I like him. I like in the BBC adaptation where they've kind of um, they've turned him into a sort of tree wizard in his exile. Like he, he looks a bit like he's been hanging out with Radagast. Or something. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like the proto Saruman, isn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> he very much looks like that. Um, but it's fascinating, isn't it? Because he doesn't know what else to do. He can't go and make a life for himself. So all he does is hang around outside the castle and watch and tries to 
make things better. And, you know, it's not because he wants to get back into the Groan's good graces. He doesn't care about that. He actually just cares about Gormenghast. Mm. Well, you and I talked before about, I, I think one of my favourite moments of the whole thing is, is uh, in, in the show, at least, is when Titus... Um, expresses to play that he he hates gormagast mm. and 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 christopher lee just i think he just says oh lordship no can't you know, be. no but but yeah it can't be that's right and and but it, it's it's with the manner of someone correct it's somewhere between correcting an incorrect child and like putting out a small kitchen fire yeah There's that kind of seriousness to it you know but it, it, it's kind of just it's it's so clearly it's an abs- it's quite a serious absurdity but it is an absurdity you know yeah and it's it's almost like a blasphemy isn't it it can't be allowed to stand but mm. it's also it's also something, it's an expression of uh, incredulity. It, it, it can't be a groan, cannot hate Gormenghast. Yeah, it's it, almost like he's, he's, something impossible has just yeah. happened and he's sort of shaking it off, you know. That's like, it. And that's it as well. I mean, he doesn't ever talk to Titus about that again. Yeah. It, it just, that's it. That's the end of that conversation. It's like, it can't be and that's it. And it's fascinating that Titus, who actually does hate Gormenghast with a fiery, fiery passion, has such a connection to Flay, who is such a functionary of it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I don't know if that's just sort of the astuteness and the fact that, you know, Flay's service to Gormenghast means that he's loyal and, to an extent, empathetic towards the, mm-hmm. the groans themselves, you know? I, I, I don't really know. I, I mean, I, I think it's so interesting you know because we, we sort of laced in and out of talking about the, the contemporary royal family with, with this and <laughs> we were talking about the you know, because as we speak, uh, the, the funeral of Prince Philip is um, is going to happen in a few days, and um, and you know the the, the media of, of you know on both sides of the Atlantic has been making a bad. I'm sure internationally has been making yeah. a big deal about the fact that Prince Harry is coming back to you know walk alongside Prince William at the funeral, and you know this is obviously some of our listeners will be aware that you know there's a, there's a bunch of tabloid stuff around the oh. royal family, always is obviously, but you know more recently with Prince Harry as the kind of outcast prince or the guy who does leave the walls almost right. you know, for various reasons um so it really it really it, titus might not be the easiest character to relate to on some levels um but it's interesting to see how kind of resonant and controversial especially amongst more traditional monarchists the idea of the prince who abdicates the duties mm. is you know oh absolutely i mean within uh the realms of i mean within the realms of gormenghast it's actually uh, almost survivalist because he is the earl you know he's the he's the inheritor there's no one else mm. there is no one else uh, unless future happen to have a child at some point which is highly unlikely um i suppose in that sense it's more like if our prince william had had left the royal family for similar reasons mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. and yeah. if there were no alternative to government as well i mean like there's no parliament in gormangas there's no politicians or anything um, I mean, I, su- I suppose it's why Titus leaving at the end of the second book, Gormenghast, is so... It's, it is it is the footstep of doom for Gormenghast itself. Because what what's left? There's Gertrude. Uh, but there's no Earl. There's no royal lineage. There's nothing. Mm. Even Fuchsia's dead, of course, at that point. Yeah, I like the way uh, in the in the TV adaptation. I like the way that Gertrude sort of seems ultimately not. I wouldn't exactly say at peace with that, but she's mm. you know because she's clearly annoyed by it. Yeah. But she's uh, but she's she's not exactly heartbroken or like garment rending either. She. I, I talked to you about the kind of nice feeling to me that the the, the, the kingdom's just going to kind of go to sleep. Yes, and that's kind of picked up in Titus alone. You do get the impression that Gormenghast doesn't exist without him. Uh, if only because no one else has ever heard of it. Mm. When he goes around telling people that he's the Earl of Gormangas, people are like, what? <laughs> it's, it's almost as though he's going around like a postmodern setting. You know, if you went around London <laughs> saying, I am the Earl of wherever, yeah, yeah, yeah. people would be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's... Like someone who's been abducted by aliens. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's the reaction that he gets. Uh, and, I mean, it's... The the interesting thing about Titus alone is that it is Titus trying to get back to Gormenghast, and even to convince himself that it existed at all, <laughs> you mm. know, to prove to himself. Um, I won't I won't spoil the ending in case you want to read it, but mm. it's fast. It is really interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting because it it actually evokes in the in the reader this sense that maybe it didn't exist 
maybe it was all just like a fever dream in this guy's head. Whoever he actually really is. He calls himself Titus Grown, but we don't know who he is. We don't know who he is. He could he could actually just be this mad wanderer who conjured Gormenghast in his head or something. And there is, at the end of the book, a kind of question lingering is it mm. is it real is it was it ever there it's interesting um this is way way beyond my my uh, you know <laughs> field of literacy or, or expertise <laughs> but i wonder i wonder it's just as a sort of as a, you know as a hypothesis there's something about quite a lot of mid 20th century sort of sci-fi fantasy literature where there's there's quite a lot of thoughtful dealing with kind of dying dynasties, isn't there? Yeah. Like you know, I, got, I I mentioned it actually in this breath because I'm I'm just I'm I've decided that a thing I'm going to do this year is read Dune. Oh my god, that's an endeavour. Yeah, well, I bet. <laughs> I mean, I was <laughs> quite a sci-fi uh... nerd as a, as a as a teenager, but I never got around to it, and it's. it's... So, I, I, I tended to dance around the, the big slab like books yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I mean it's too. huge. I mean it's yeah. huge and it is incredible. It's a it's a it's a stunning book, a stunning series of books. But it's it's that it's that kind of science fiction whereby I find if I try to understand it while I'm reading it, it doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. If I allow it to wash over me and just read it in an almost zen-like state of mind, then it's a beautiful experience. Right, right. The oh, so I'll, I'll light a few joss sticks then. I'll get some, uh, yeah. you know, some nice wine in. That's probably a good idea. That's probably a good idea. There's so much detail in it. There's so many things happening all at once. There are so many names and concepts and notions thrown at you at any given time. It's one of the densest mythologies I've ever come across. Right. I, I mean, I, I used to have a, a good mind for those kind of things. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, like like a lot of kids, obviously, I got really into kind of big, complicated worlds like that. Likewise, particularly with the, yeah. uh, as, the actually in sci-fi terms, the, I was a proper Asimov head as a teenager. Right, is, right. Um, I'm hoping to revisit on the podcast before too long, actually. But um, I am. Um, I actually kind of, you know, from what little I, I don't know, I hardly know any details about the Dune series, really, in mm. terms of plot um, details and things like that. But but what I do know is that the the books later get pretty pretty far out. You know, like they, they get kind of. <laughs> Yeah. I'm talking about you know things like people turning into sandworms and things like oh, that. Oh, they know? they get like proper metaphysical. That the, there is yeah. a there is a, an incredible metaphysics to this series, and it's it's not like specifically explained. <laughs> I don't think it would make any sense if it were. Mm-hmm. Towards the end, it kind of reminds me a little bit of reading Valus by Philip K. Dick, um, which is a book. Philip K. Dick wrote when he was on the very verge of losing his sanity. Right. Yeah. And I've not read shows. that one, but I remember reading about it. It shows. Valis, Valis alongside, funnily enough, alongside Titus alone, which which Mervyn Peake wrote when, when he was also losing his, his mind, um, they are, the, they are the, the two books I've ever read that not only capture a really sincere sense of the author losing themselves, but they make the reader feel as though they're losing themselves. <laughs> it's a really strange experience. It's very odd. Um, and it kind of makes me reluctant to go back to them. Mm. Just I, for... I'd, like to, I'd like to read that. I've read a few Pathetic Dick ones, but not Valus. Um... Valus is amazing. I've only read it once, and I don't know if I'll ever read it again, to be perfectly honest. I, I don't even know if I could tell you much about it. It's such a an acid trip experience of a book. Hmm. It's... I was very, I was very uh, um, impressed with the Man in the High Castle when I read that in my early twenties. Ah, yes, I, I mean, I love Philip K. Dick, I really do. I mean, there is, um, there is a tendency to pigeonhole him in terms of his fiction, and there are definitely recurrent themes all the way through. Like, I struggle to think actually of a, a not only a book but a story in general by Philip K. Dick that doesn't deal with some kind of identity crisis. For example, it's obviously <laughs> yeah. every single one is about an identity crisis, but there's way, way, way more than that going on in Philip K. Dick's work. At its best, it's transcendent. Well, I mean, even in The Man in the High Castle, you know, which is, I guess, one of his more read ones, you know, the, the, and especially with the TV adaptation well, in yes, recent years, um, the, the identity crisis is sort of that of the universe itself, isn't it? Or that exactly. of the timeline. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's the identity of, like, cultures, isn't it? And realities and whatnot. Um, Going back no. to the trauma of the Second World War. You know? yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, I mean, Dick kind of captures it perfectly in that book, doesn't he? I mean, he expresses the very notion that I was talking about earlier there. Um but yeah, Valus is a 
you need to be in the right frame of mind to take that one. Right. I'm not even sure I could tell you anything about it, having yeah. read it. It's it's so bizarre. I I know I know that it involves a it involves the the return of Jesus Christ, but as a computer program. Right. Good. But good also. Start. A computer program that manifests biologically in a person, right? <laughs> and so on. It just oh, go, it just it just gets stranger. You know, it's so weird. Well, you know, I'll wait till I've had my second vaccine, George, and then I'll. Uh, yeah, I'll, I think I'll, it sounds like I'll need it. That's a good idea, actually. In fact, try reading it like the day after when you're in the the floaty frame of mind that the vaccine could you know yeah. you're, not, you're not a doctor are you <laughs> no no i'm really not no not a good frame of mind to be reading that um anywho we were i mean we have a, a topic we do have a topic this evening yeah um which is an amazing one really because it's it's one that i've i've kind of wanted to talk about for a long long time but it's it's slightly problematic i find on a on like a cultural level because the the Commodore Amiga and those the sort of microcomputers I suppose the microcomputer culture that we had in the UK is so niche. It's so uh, it's so much a phenomena of its time and of its era, mm. uh, and therefore only really has relevance to a, kind of a small demographic. There are only certain people of certain ages that this will chime with. Um, what I find when you look at YouTube, because obviously video game culture and computer culture on YouTube is enormous. It's huge. It's some mm. of the biggest channels in on the platform are to do with video games and video game culture. But um, what I find is it tends to be more USA centric and more Japan centric, which makes enormous sense, given that those nations kind of dominate in many respects um so you hear things like like you know the video game crash in the 1980s which we didn't experience mm, yeah. i didn't even know that was a thing until i started watching documentaries on youtube yeah this was this is kind of uh this was when you know et got buried in the desert and all right that, yeah. i had i had no idea about that i had absolutely no idea what i love about that is that's an example of evolving video game culture because of course people initially not that long ago thought that that was an urban myth <laughs> yeah the notion that there were these vast potholes out in the desert where there were just just ton mountains of copies of et that had never sold and which had nearly buried the american video game industry um but it's true that's it's so bizarre that's still so bizarre it's actually true there actually are these vast 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 potholes that have been filled to the brim with these cartridges that were just never sold people have gone and found them you know? <laughs> people have actually <laughs> gone out and found them and youtube being youtube have filmed it yeah, uh, of, of course. course yeah. And Unboxing as a, the desert, so to speak. Right, and of course, as a result of that that phenomena, you had the uh, the uh, the escalation of Nintendo and Sega taking over the market in in Japan in in the United States. That didn't happen here in the same way. It did eventually happen because Sega and Nintendo just dominated everything eventually, but it didn't happen in the same way. We had our own sort of brief i suppose brief but really bright and interesting uh video game culture for mm. a long long time yeah, and, the, and, and you it's know, interesting for, that the sort of relative chaos of the early 90s video game scene that, that i'm having to sort of reconstruct in my head and i'll, I'll go into that in a bit when we talk about right. our memories of that period it, it kind of reflects the chaos of my own mind as a mm. child you know because i i had no idea what the hell was going on you right. know I, I, was, I mean i was grasping i was just starting to put all this stuff together well this is i was thinking about this earlier this i mean and this is something that um i've discussed with our mutual friend kit power before we are part of generations that briefly remember a time before there even were not just the internet but anything like a home computer or video game console briefly mm, you know about, I, mean, yeah. I the commodore amiga was my first computer it was the first computer i ever had um and i i believe that i we got our commodore amiga when i was about six or seven so quite young but i do still recall a time before there was anything computerized barring things like calculators and whatnot mm. um 
and that is a really strange thing. So we have grown up, we've evolved along with that particular medium and that phenomena. Very much, yeah. Our input is very, very different and our experience of media as a result is very, very different from that of our parents, for example. I find there's much more of a distance between our parents' generation and this technology than there is for us. As I imagine the same is true for latter generations, you know? It becomes more and more intimate, I imagine, and, and integrated as the generations go on. Well, um, it, this is the thing, like, so, so a lot of the periods that I'll be talking about from my personal experience uh, in this, I've, I've been doing some date checking today, <laughs> <laughs> using some <laughs> online sources and things like that, uh, but um, I, I'll be talking about my sort of experience with the Amiga 500 mm -hmm. from in, in sort of 1992 to like at latest kind of 1994, and right. that's, for, that for me is age 7 to uh, uh, nine really yeah so it's just i i mean what i remember we'll go into more of this but like what mm. i remember about the amiga and other sort of equivalent home computers in the in the early 90s was you'd you'd get them home as artifacts of the neighborhood and people just didn't like <laughs> there were very very varying degrees of people knowing what to make of them yes you know like you know within individual families not just mm -hmm. not just within the neighborhood with you know like it, and it wouldn't always be like you know mum or dad would know how to work it and the kids wouldn't it right. would often be the other way around yeah or you'd often have this really weird disconnect where maybe one sibling was adept and the other siblings couldn't didn't know what the hell to do with it exactly and, or one parent was in that position you know and it was and or there'd be you know a, a person on the street who was known as the guy you know the guy or girl who who got computers or you right know, was, because they happened to work with them at work or something like that or yeah. studied them at university maybe but exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is so. This is this is an example of what of how far removed that culture was. I mean, the Commodore Amiga in the UK was basically one of the antecedents to home computing. Mm. You had you had examples of that. Certainly, uh, certain earlier examples of that that were much cruder, like the BBC microcomputers, for example. Mm. We had those um, in our school. They ended yeah. up in our primary school by the early nineties. Yeah, the RM Nimbus mm. ones, which were often in primary schools. Um, the Acorn computers, that kind of thing. But the, the Amiga was the first, I imagine the first thing, the first phenomena that people who are, who are, are around now, looking back at the history of computing, would recognize as a computer system that actually had like a, a Windows-based operating system. It had a disk mm. drive and all of that kind of thing. But the thing is, back then, when the Amiga first hit, it wasn't the case that a computer was just as standard in a household as like a television or whatever. Most households did not have a computer of any kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really strange. And I think like, the, you know, so again, this will all be sort of based on personal experience as much mm. as I've been able to scrabble together. But, you know, our, we got our Amiga 500 and it would have been in the latter half of 1992. I, th I think it was mm. either my birthday or Christmas was used as, as an excuse for it. I think that's right. probably making it more me centric than it was. <laughs> but uh but it, it went up in the loft, you know. I mean, it, it went up in the in the attic, and, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a little desk set up for it. And I think it, was, it almost was like this weird sort of um, like shrine, you know. We yeah. weren't quite sure what was going on with it, you know. Yeah. I think, and, and to be honest, I think that was a pretty democratic confusion, you know. I think my parents were as befuddled on a different level, you know. Yeah, it was almost like a mystic thing, wasn't it? it the the yeah. computer having a computer in the household was a strange and slightly scary thing, because it just wasn't the same back then as it is now. You know, computers are so ubiquitous that most people, when they get a new computer, know exactly what to do from the moment they turn it on. They know exactly how to work it. They, even if it's like a new operating system, they intuit how to do it because we've just learnt from experience you know yeah. most households have multiple computerized things you know they have mobile phones they have laptops they often have a big desktop computer and so on and so forth it just didn't happen back then it did not happen and the commodore amiga was probably the first time a it was affordable i mean don't get me wrong it was an expensive bit of kit yeah it, yeah it was very expensive but at the same time compared to other systems that could do the same things as it did actually not that bad it wasn't that expensive you know certain households could afford them uh, it's funny um, you used to say that i i actually suspect because i was doing a bit of theorizing as well as you know like uh, date checking and stuff and mm -hmm. i think my family you know like a lot of families who are kind of you know low middle class in in origin really mm -hmm. my, my my family basically got a fair, like what middle class financial security they had largely when my dad's parents died and this yeah. was in about 1991 you know they died within mm -hmm. a year of each other um and they and they got they weren't they weren't wealthy at all they had a little no. you know terraced house in north manchester you know but but they were 
in in the little financial security they could pass on to my mum and dad, and my dad being an only child, we probably became, uh, you know, mid- functionally middle class. You know, from yeah, that. it's, and, it's and, funny, and, and, and it's and it's notable that the Amiga then came into our, our life the next year. You know, that so. is really funny. What happened with my my family? Because of course we we're we're working class too. You know, we're from working class roots. My dad at the time was a butcher, and uh, my mum didn't work. She didn't have to. Um, she was raising me and my brother. Um, what happened was my grandfather won a little bit of money on the pools. Right, right. Not yeah. much, not in, like not enormous amounts, not life changing money, but enough to, enough to buy his council house and enough to give my mum and dad a little bit of money. And what they used some of that money for was to buy because the the Commodore Amiga was really pushed hard as not just a gaming device, but as like a household utility. Yeah, yeah, it could do lots of different things, which was also very rare at the time. It could do things like word processing, and it had like a database system, and it could, you could, you know, if you were clever, you could use it to program. You could, you could use it to create spreadsheets and things like that. So mm. it was like a futuristic device. It really was that sense of the future is now. You know, mm. that's how it was pushed. Um, when I was so, reading up today online, I saw that you know because I'll, I'll have a bit to say about some of the Amiga magazines in, in, yeah. in, in a bit. But um, I, I read today. I had no idea about this because I wouldn't have been interested at the time. But I read that mm. there were there were actually specific Amiga magazines that were for what you might call the grown up stuff. Yeah, yeah. There was like Amiga Format, for example, and Amiga Format was one of the more grown up ones, and that didn't it did deal with games, but not to the same degree. It it often had a much drier quality about it, and it would talk about how you could use the Amiga for programs and for creating this and that you know it was a more technical exercise mm. seems so niche now i mean even in a world that's kind of made of niches now mm-hmm. you know i mean it just seems it seems so bizarre doesn't it that that would be kind of this kind of mainstream pushed thing that was it's, thought to be of, of wide of wide appeal and, and was really you know? it really was i mean it was a very popular and also i mean this is something people don't get at the time it was the most powerful system in existence back then at the time it was absolutely revolutionary it was doing things with um with not only like word processing and the more utilitarian stuff that no other system could do uh, and was also it also had things like the workbench of course the workbench was the operating system and it yeah. was very very much an antecedent to windows to be honest okay I, george i'd forgotten the term workbench in this context until today when yeah. i looked it up and i was like oh yeah the work the workbench <laughs> yeah and it was brilliant it was such a simple but at the same time infinitely complex system you could do so so much with the workbench i remember because you had to boot it up do you remember that you didn't yeah. like it wasn't like a laptop and it wasn't like like or like a computer where you would turn it on and the operating system would just be there what you had to do was put the the workbench disk in and then the workbench would come up and then you could take the workbench disk out and it would still be up you could still use it you know mm. um and then you could use the workbench to do all manner of things it was all just very mechanical and but sort of bespoke wasn't it it was sort yeah. of like you you were cobbling together your own computing experience kind of bit by bit as you as you did it it was very quite so. it was quite it was almost like the gamification of having a having a system wasn't it? yeah very much and you could just customize it you could actually do so many different things with it um that was totally revolutionary at the time i mean you got to the point whereby a lot of really high profile tv shows were using the commodore amiga to do their effects so you had things like uh nightmare nightmare used um the commodore amiga at uh, from its fourth season onward to do its special effects um the chart show do you remember the chart show uh, just about yeah the chart show used um the wind actually not only used the workbench to create its effects it actually used the format of the workbench itself in the show wow so a mouse would move around the screen as the show was going on and would click on icons to bring up the the latest music video or whatever or to bring oh, up Oh, I need to see a clip of that. That's yeah. Oh. It was so weird. There was even like um as the music videos were playing in the background like a little mouth icon would come up and the mouse cursor would move over it and click on it and little sound bites would come up with trivia about the music video and about the band and whatnot. I think I think very little would take me down the rabbit hole of deep memory of as kind of the aesthetics of those 
kind of early to mid 90s tv shows that were aimed at me like things like right. games master you games know? master bloody hell jesus yeah. that's yeah games Trying master playing patrick moore in games master to anyone born <laughs> you know in the last 10 years would be uh, you know <laughs> trying to explain the phenomena of video game tv shows which were they were very rare they they like the the culture just did not cotton on to how epoch making video games are going to be they always had like tv always had this kind of like oh, i don't want to go near it quality with video games didn't it you know and even when you got ga- you know shows like games master that were really big they had this kind of like down in the basement quality didn't they there was a kind of like dirty deviant quality like a counterculture quality to them and yeah, i think it was almost like a bit of that nosing around from the young ones mixed in as well wasn't there like the kind so, of youth culture at arm's length you know so awkward was. hipsterism you know it so was but it also resulted in these weirdly inventive and often very surreal project product so games master where you had like as you say a digitized sir patrick moore turning up with all of these weird animated like biomechanical things all over him so, uh, dispensing video game advice so yeah. weird so yeah, that's, that's, weird. that's as weird as anything from dune actually isn't it when you yeah it it's so strange i mean I, but i used to love it i used to love it because it felt like it was talking to us you know, it actually felt like there was a bit of popular culture, a bit of like mainstream media that was talking to us about things we understood, um, which our parents almost certainly did not. Mm. Almost certainly did not. And the Amiga dropped at that time, didn't it? You know, when it didn't initially, it wasn't initially marketed as a video games console exclusively, but it did become apparent as the years wore on that that was where it was at. Hmm. And it became almost exclusively marketed as a video games console after that. Um, because it was just doing stuff that hardly anything else was at the time. It was revolutionary. Mm. It was abs- I didn't know this at the time. I had no idea. Because it was, for me, it was my first experience. I, I, I had no concept of what video games were. I had no concept of how they worked until we got our Commodore Amiga. And I, re- I remember the day. I actually remember the day I was at a friend's house um, and it relates back to what you were talking about earlier where these we there was just no context for what a computer was so I got a phone call from my parents saying oh we've got this computer this we've got this computer set up at home and my mom was describing to me she was describing lemmings to me (laughs) <laughs> she was describing because we got like you know one of those amiga packages that they used to do that had yeah, like we, yeah, yeah. we got the cartoon classics package oh i'm glad you said that so did i you got the cartoon, so <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, you yeah. you know so it had like it had lemmings and it had a terrible captain planet video game yeah like yeah, had it god awful but at at the time i had no idea it was god awful it was just one of the first video games so it was interesting you know and it had bart versus the space mutants with it yeah yeah that's uh that that for all it's bizarre they live aping uh, wow i I mean simpsons games simpsons games were everywhere at that period because of course that that was the period when the simpsons were just taking over the world well and well and also it's it's important to remind people that for british for most british viewers i'd say for the majority of british viewers then the simpsons was more kind of known about rather yes. than experienced because this was pre the bbc broadcaster that's um, right it was simpsons. only on the sky channels and you only got the sky channels if you were kind of rich i think i think you well yeah <laughs> i think uh, i think the bbc started showing the simpsons in 96 i'd have to look that up but uh, but this is the, certainly my knowledge of the simpsons was primarily from bart simpsons versus the space mutants and yeah. from some neighbors you know like videos from blockbusters basically exactly until, that uh, i um, until probably about 95 you know? it was bart versus the space mutants and some recordings from my cousins who had was slightly richer and had sky you know Mm. That was it. That was my experience of The Simpsons. My, um, my favorite episode of the, this is a side track, but my <laughs> favorite episode of The Simpsons to date is is still um, the one where I think it's like second series where Marge tries to make Itchy and Scratchy less violent. Oh my um, god! Because yeah. that was that was that, that was my one on a tape from a relative. Right. Uh, and me and my brother for a while that was the one we had and me and right. my brother watched it probably about 600 times I, and i still uh, think it's a masterpiece i remember the very first episode i ever saw it was um, it was at my cousin's they taped an episode off of the television which was the one where homer discovers that he has a half brother 
Oh yeah, that's yeah, played Danny by DeVito, uh, Danny DeVito. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and he's actually rich. He's like a like a he, he makes cars, doesn't yeah. he? Herb. Herb. That's right. Yes, yeah. Herb. Yeah, that was the very first episode I ever saw, and I do recall it features a, a really you know for the era a really like near the knuckle scene where Bart it, describes Herb as a bastard. Right. I like <laughs> like and he uses the word. But Bart's justification is, well, he was born out of wedlock, wasn't he? It's a correct word, isn't right. it? Right. That's a, that's, a, that's to to appeal to wordy kids. It's um, very. I mean, yeah. It, you it, know, I I don't drive, but I still kind of want that car that Homer designs. Oh in that bloody hell! That car with the bubble domes and <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah. Right, yeah. Looks amazing. I love the reaction of the audience when it's revealed. You just get that. <gasps> Yeah, it's like it's the producers, isn't it? You yeah, know, it's great. Springtime for Hitler's opening night. It's absolutely brilliant. But yeah, Bart. But, but uh, what I what I remember is like Mum phoning me, and I was having fun at my friends, right? And I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand really what she was describing. She was talking about this computer, but it was like I couldn't get a grasp on it because I didn't know what a computer was. I didn't really know what video games were. So I was like, there, she was like, oh, she was really excited, you know. Oh, you've got to come home. You've got to have a look at this. And I was sort of like, oh, I'm having fun here, so I'll stay here for a bit, you know. And yeah. they were, oh, okay, fine. But eventually, I did go home, and there, there was this thing, this this vast thing, as it was, you know, it was massive, set up on the initially on like the breakfast board in the kitchen, so everyone mm. had access to it, and I remember Mum trying to show me how it worked. How you used the mouse to do this? How you had to put the floppy disks in to yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah. The the first thing I ever played on it wasn't any of the games that came with it because she also she'd also been up to the news agents and here's another thing that's going to age both of us and this entire phenomena. She'd gone up to the news agents and she'd gotten a copy of Amiga Action, right? Sure. Which <laughs> was an Amiga magazine that had demo discs on the front this was a thing uh, in the day you couldn't obviously there's no internet so the way you played demos on on consoles and whatnot was that you would sometimes get discs free discs on the front of magazines they were sellotape to the magazine Mm -hmm. (laughs) sounds bonkers doesn't it i mean like like looking at it in context it was bonkers (laughs) it is it was bonkers it was absolutely bonkers and the magazine would have instructions in it on what you had to type in on the workbench to get the disc to (laughs) run that's right yeah and it was a copy of Amiga Action that had on. I, I remember the cover, and it's ridiculous. I remember it's these these images are so burned into my mind. It's ridiculous, because they're formative. You know, they're so formative. They are the first experiences of a certain phenomena. I remember the 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 issue had like a picture of a. It was a tank on the front. I don't know why it was a tank. I don't even know what video game that actually was. But the demo discs had. They had this game that immediately snared my attention. It was called Wolf Child. Right. <laughs> and it was a it was a game by Core Design who would go on to make Tomb Raider. Mm. Way, way later on. But that was the first thing I ever played. I put this demo disc in and you had to I don't know why I remember this. You had to type it on the workbench, run Wolf Child <laughs> with like a hyphen in between. And that would run the demo. <laughs> And it was... Run Wolf Child sounds like an incantation. It does, it? doesn't it? In a weird, yeah, it kind of does. And what you got was the second level from the full game, which was like a forest level. And I can, I'm can i playing the music in my head right now. I can hear the soundtrack to that, that level. It's ridiculous. And it was like this really dark, deep, very sort of like dusky wood that was full of mutated trees and monsters and things and it's kind of like a side-scrolling platformer adventure game you know with lots of monsters and pickups and things like that but what i remember more than anything is being fast because of course I, I i did i had no notion of the technical limitations of video games back then it meant nothing to me of course mm. it, like, it wouldn't even be a concept so i remember looking into the background of this level where there were like layers of parallax scrolling into the background to create the illusion of depth and you could see like deeper woods and hills and things and i remember thinking to myself what's back there how do i get <laughs> back there You know, how do I explore those areas? Is there a way to get back there? And it seemed perfectly logical to me that, of course, you could. Mm. Why wouldn't you be able to do that, you know? Mm. And I remember like spending a long time trying to figure out how to do that. Um, But I 
I do believe that that is one of the earliest instances, outside of like imaginative play with action figures and things, of me projecting imagination into a into a piece of media and making stories out of it. Yeah, well, the gaps in the... I mean, not that we... Again, we didn't know much about it then, but uh, except through the, our sort of beginning experiences, but like the, the you, you would put your imaginative power into the gaps in the games wouldn't you and into the the limits because I, I was actually it's funny you mentioned the sort of edges of the world there because I've, I've been playing this is outside the scope of this podcast mm-hmm. but i was i was i've been playing quite a lot of n64 recently and then n64 right. is like my kind of not first love because we're basically talking about my first love yeah. but you know the n64 is like the you know the flowering of my interest in video yeah. games it's my, my kind of golden age you know? it's kind of like but, the growing up of video games you know or the adolescence of them Certainly for me, yeah, and it's kind of you know the N sixty four was when I was at my peak yeah. of obsessiveness and you know magazine <laughs> collection and stuff like that. But I was I've been playing you know some of the big canonical ones like Mario sixty four and course, Zelda and stuff. Yeah, and I forget in those relatively early questing kind of three D world games how the edge of the world is always this thing that they never quite never, you know, like define. It's just there, yeah. isn't it? It's just there. That's the edge of the playfield, and there's often nothing there. Yeah, it's funny actually coming off talking to you about Gormenghast and then straight into a, right. other, you know, other worlds that have this kind of bizarre nothing outside you know, Right, uh... yeah, it is kind of weird, isn't it? But, I mean, I can even, like, see, like, I'm actually picturing in my head the castle, you know, the hub world in Super Mario 64, which isn't mm. unlike Gormenghast. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, yeah, well, well Hyrule, Hyrule Castle has, has similarities as well. Of course, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a classic, isn't it, Ocarina of Time? It's an absolute classic, people remember that so fondly. Yeah, I'm hoping to talk about that on the show soon as well, but you know, I won't get ahead of myself. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but but you, I mean, th- those the technical limitations of these games, you you just because kids are, I mean, yeah, generalization again, but kids are so imaginative at yeah. that age, and their their minds are so, um, they're still they're still sh- being shaped, you know, and kind it. of kind of falling into place, and it, it's kind of I I found that world of of the kind of Amiga demo discs and and exposure to gaming in general increasingly unsupervised as well. I should say that was mm, yeah, likewise. You know, because we, we, I mean, the nearest we had to a supervised gaming experience on the Amiga. Well, I mean, you know, we had we had cert, certain ones where mum or dad would, you know, hold up, try and hold our hands for a little bit with some of yeah. them. But um, but the, the biggest and actually unique experience in my gaming history is Lemmings because we <laughs> wow. coming off this cartoon classics uh, collection as well because that is the only game ever that me, uh, mum, dad, and my brother Matt all all played together, and we played it in the way that I imagine a lot of families played it, which mm-hmm. is some person whoever was more adept you know or could be more adept, was in the steering seat and yeah. everyone else yelled instructions yeah yeah <laughs> like a proper team you know like a family team sport you know it was like like, like we we're playing you know um trivial pursuit or something you know it was Super. kind of uh, it's real and that's it. no other video game ever took us all like that no i think lemmings is a bit of a leveler in that regard you know because not, i mean my my whole family didn't play lemmings because my dad just just finds computers baffling they just they're just not part of his purview you know but lemmings my mother absolutely adored that game i like adored it to the point whereby she was the master by yeah. the end of like she was the absolute master sometimes we would come home from school and she'd be uh, she, she'd be like up in the computer room <laughs> she was having a go at lemmings um she finished it she actually yeah. did lemmings i've i've still got the bits of graph paper that have got all of her codes written down well i was i was as you know george i was messaging you about this but i was playing through the original lemmings on an emulator recently mm-hmm. and i was you know semi because you, you were picking up your mum's prowess in, in that and i was semi joking that i might need some help yeah. you know because it, it's those those later lemmings levels are no laughing matter yeah oh the taxing levels yeah oh, may, uh, mayhem is above mayhem that. that's it mayhem that's right so it goes how is it it's it's easy uh, it's fun, tricky, fun, tricky, taxing, taxing mayhem. mayhem. That's it. That's it. I mean, of the of the games that came in that cartoon classics pack, the two that were actually based on like cartoon franchises actually weren't that good, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Lemmings, which isn't really based on a cartoon franchise, is amazing. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing game. Did you um? Did you see that? Um, this is this is a trivia thing I read today when I was reading up about Amiga games. Did you see that? Um, we talked before about the Amiga magazines, and I think we we got Amiga format and Amiga Power at mm-hmm. various times. I think there'll be there'll be some of those issues lying around in the loft at my yeah, mom's house. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to retrieve them at the moment. But <laughs> um, I um I read today online that I think uh, these magazines used to run kind of um 
apart from the demo disc, they used to run like sort of game design competitions, yeah. and they used to actually advertise and kind of propagate these, you know, proper DIY home games. Oh, and, yeah. and, I, and I and I think I, someone will need to fact check me. I'm sure there's many people who listen to your YouTube channel who know much better than me on a lot of this, but I believe Worms resulted from one of those. I've I, I that wouldn't surprise me. That actually wouldn't surprise me. I know that. I mean, we used to get Amiga Action like regularly, which is generally considered to be one of the the less good amiga <laughs> magazines it just isn't very good but they used to run alongside like the demos of the the larger studio games that they used to have there was always a section on those demo discs for what were called pd games mm -hmm. which were um I, I don't know what the what the acronym actually stands for but it they were basically games that were designed by individuals at home I wonder if it's like player developed or something. Player like that. developed, something like that, yeah. quite possibly, yeah. quite possibly. Um, what would be called indie games now? Mm. That's what that was, and many of them were very impressive. Mm. Very impressive, considering that this was again, this was kind of towards the the end of the era of the bedroom coder that was going on in the UK. That was more focused in the sort of Sinclair Spectrum era, which is kind of the previous generation of computers. Yeah, that's the we, kind of uh, Black Mirror Bandersnatch. Exactly, yeah. Era. Well, Bandersnatch is based very, very closely on the lives of two very particular personages from the days of the Sinclair Spectrum. Oh, is it? I didn't know. Yeah, it. it's, it's almost autobiographical. <laughs> it's almost autobiographical, yeah. I liked, I liked Band. Sorry, again, sidebar. I no, I loved it. I loved I think, it. I, I think it got quite a lot of um, lukewarm press because there's, there's kind of, um, there's a lot of. This is a whole other topic, but I, I think there's a lot of people who are kind of, for various, often quite valid reasons, are kind of a bit fed up with Charlie Brooker, mm. or you know, with with Black Mirror, or you know, yeah. just Charlie Brooker's creative projects in general. And I can completely understand that, mm -hmm. but I think, I think the show itself tends to get a lot of the opprobrium from people being a bit sick of him yeah that that it doesn't deserve and i think quite i think bandas in my opinion i think bandersnatch got quite a bit of that kind of almost like a big kind of review equivalent of a shrug yeah. and i was and, and i was actually kind of like mildly not annoyed is putting it a bit strongly but i was kind of like do you not see how like potentially this is really exciting right yeah i mean i i really enjoyed bandersnatch i mean part of my enjoyment of it is because i actually really like the era it was referencing and the the little the little touchstones and references that it made i thought were brilliant because it really mm. does very very sincerely reflect that era of video game design and what it was actually like um and I, I thought that was wonderful, you know, the fact that it is actually talking to people who understand this very, very niche subject and experience. But I also thought it was a very interesting experiment as well, you know, yeah. in terms of interactive television. I thought it was great. I thought it was yeah. very interesting. Why isn't there more of this? Well, exactly. And I, know, and I know it's building on previous stuff. Obviously, people mm. will be, you know, yelling at me in their, in their heads, you know, like, you know, obviously it had loads of precedents and, you know, like going yeah, way back to yeah. kind of interactive video games themselves and you know things that have always tried to take tv and all that kind of interaction but um maybe i just like this because it had alice low in it i don't know, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know none, none of the previous attempts did but uh, <laughs> it's uh but no I, I yeah i think we're on the same page with that but yeah i mean it's it's it, that that kind of era of, of of you know player developed content and and kind of i mean you know a lot of that would have gone over my head at the time because mm -hmm. I, I mean my, my main memory of, of the amiga 500 is and this is going to sound really dismissive and it's <laughs> not because i have loads of gaming memories of it is it's basically it, it's my own struggles with incompetence because it's kind of <laughs> and, I, and i don't mean that judgmentally i mean like i literally couldn't do it a lot of the time because yeah. it was like i, I was I, as i say i was um seven eight playing these games mm -hmm. and i my, my young brother is two and a half years younger than me right which is right. quite a lot a lot when you're that age you know that mm -hmm. like he he was a little kid you know yeah, even when yeah. it, you know and and he, you know and we got on quite well then and we still do you know and so we were like playing all these games together but i was obviously to, to, to the extent that i could play them at all i was obviously holding his hand a little bit mm -hmm. and um and you know it, it just i remember you know because there's just very basic things like i couldn't really type right you know yeah. for example you know I, I think there was actually a typing like educational program that was one of the things that i had tried my hand at occasionally mm -hmm. which is meant to make you better at this kind of stuff you know because <laughs> they obviously they released quite a lot of educational stuff for the uh, yeah the there league. was loads spelling stuff you know mathematics things there was loads of things for it yeah so it's just i mean but but i do remember like it's funny you mentioned nightmare actually you know because i know you're, you're, you're talking in that case about the show kind of yes you know, absolutely but i actually i was i was i've actually made a list here of like amiga games that you know i had some experience of whether they be demo or full games mm -hmm. we'll, we'll touch on some of these but i i i had did have a demo of the nightmare game yeah the nightmare rpg yes i did too 
yeah, so that that is one of the weird. Uh, you probably got further than that with me, but apart from <laughs> this, you, you've got a couple of years on me. But I think, but um, but I, my mate, that's one of my most memorable video game memories, but not really in a good way no. because it was basically me walking around what must have been like the initial maze, or mm-hmm. you know, like like kind of like fifty meters square space. Uh, with loads of foreboding noises and wailing yes. and all that sort of stuff, and just not knowing how on earth to get out of there. Yeah, and you know, and and me and Matt, uh, me and my brother, he didn't know. Um, we asked mum and dad; they probably shrugged or said <laughs> they were too busy or like, what the hell is that even? And we were yeah. so we were just walking around this kind of labyrinth with, with I think I think like every maybe like every third day of playing we'd meet a monster or yeah. something like that and we wouldn't know how to fight it either and we just but we we had this fascination with the show and with you know what was this new experience of gaming and we, we just kept on going and it was it was such a strange experience i think that's really common with the amiga to be perfectly honest because and just from video games of that era because it, this is another thing that's very difficult to convey like video games were just not as established as a medium back then so a lot of these games are experiments there's not like coders or templates for how you produce this type of video game Mm, there's not the history to build on there's not the precedent and there's there's not the refinement so a lot of the video games for the amiga were really strange they were really strange in terms of the way they were structured they were really strange in terms of the way they controlled and they were really bloody strange in terms of how what you actually had to do Mm. how you how you figured out what you had to do in some of these games is so obscure and so oblique. I mean, even some of like, I mean, what, let's take like one of the simpler for, one of the simpler subgenres, which is platformers. There were loads of platformers on the Amiga. You know, there were the likes of Robocod and James Pond and that kind of thing. Absolutely mm. brilliant video games. But a lot of them, they, there is this whole phenomena of the Euro platformer, which has sort of been established now in retrospect. Which is, it's those platformers that were developed sort of outside of Japan, really. Mm-hmm. Where they're, what, they're, they're, they're not the Sonic the Hedgehogs, they're not the Super Mario Brothers, they're not these sort of hyper-refined video games where the goal is very simple and where the, the controls are very sharp. The Amiga never really had that. A lot of the video games like are very unresponsive and very difficult to get to grips with. So you need <laughs> to take into account things like when you move the joystick, your character is going to move like a split second later. Or sometimes, oh, that joystick. Yeah. yeah, or sometimes uh, yeah. quite a lot longer later, you know? Yeah. And when you've got moving platforms and blind falls and spike pits and whatnot, that may, yeah. that can be very bloody tricky indeed. And, yeah, and, and although it's a joystick, you're not exactly talking the, uh, you know, the fine analog controls, are you? <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. But that was just something you learned to cope with on the Amiga and it actually became part of the experience so you just learned that there was a timing element involved yeah I mean I I'm exactly the same most of my games for the Amiga I could not complete oh no that Captain Planet one you were talking about whether or not that's a good game or not and I think it probably wasn't um I I, I struggled (laughs) Captain Planet is um I mean I've got a lot of affection for it because again it's one of the earliest video games I ever played but it's a nightmare like just figuring out what you've got to do in that game is a nightmare so you have that situation where you've got a limited character select so at the beginning of the game you can select two of the planeteers uh the fire one and the water one wheeler and gee i think their names are. i don't know yeah, why i, remember I think you're that. right I don't, I re- you're don't right. know why i remember that i, I loved captain planet i loved, I loved like the music the music to that game is great um but like in each level it's really again this is an example of what the amiga was like and what the games were like at the time any like if that were a game on the mega drive for example or on the super nintendo which dominated later largely what you would have to do is get from point a to point b there would be like you start at the beginning of the level and you'd have to get to the end Mm. that's not the case with the captain planet game there are loads of tasks that you have to complete in each of the levels in order to open up the exit so in Wheeler's level, for example, the fire level, first of all, you've got to clear away all of the toxic waste. And get it, it, it doesn't look like toxic waste. It looks like coloured blocks that are just all around <laughs> and you've just got to blast them away. Yeah. Me, like dodging all of these monsters and things that have absolutely nothing to do with the show, by, by the way. After you've done that, you need to get into, like, you know, the Planeteer's jet thingy? Yeah, I can't remember what it's called either, but yeah. You need yeah. to get into that and... You need to stop the 
ozone layer from being destroyed by what appear to be weather balloons which are dropping like stuff on it listen george that was that was what was going on at the time that, right that was, and then happened. you need to collect this stuff that's coming out of a pipe on the far side of the screen and use that stuff to repair the gaps that have been made in the ozone layer then when it's been repaired you need to go up further in the level and for reasons that are totally beyond me in the clouds there are polar bears <laughs> you know what i sort of remember that and you've got to like guide the polar bears so they drop down onto the now completed ozone layer which is basically a bridge now mm. and guide them to the exit can you imagine, apart from anything else in terms of gameplay and genre and stuff, can you imagine what kids getting all their environmentalism from that game, how, what their worldview was like in the later right. 90s? It's totally bonkers, isn't it? It's totally bonkers. But what gets me, like, just on a purely video game level, how do you figure that out? <laughs> There's no instructions. There's no, there is no point in that game or in that level where it says, do this, go here, do that. Mm. You've just got to figure it out. <laughs> well, one thing, one thing you might have had similar actually, but one thing my dad used to say to me and my brother um, was was always he had this real um, incredulousness about the fact that me and my brother would pick up games and just walk, run with them, yeah, and just I just kind of he was like, why aren't you reading the instructions? We're like, we don't need to, you know. We've, don't we, need well, to. I don't think we I don't think we expressed it this well, but we we're like we've played games like this before. Yep. But actually, but actually, what that was that was actually a much more accurate picture of me and my brother in the slightly later kind of SNES Mega Drive mm -hmm. era, because well, at least it came later for us because. Um, because in the Amiga, we really did need the instructions, and we, and we yeah. often didn't have them, you know. A lot of the time, you really, really did, because the the controls to these games were often not simple. There were there were very strange, like, manoeuvres you sometimes had to perform with that joystick in order to get things to move. I remember a game I absolutely loved uh, called Myth History in the Making, mm -hmm. which it, it came packaged with this comic that was drawn by 2000 AD artists. It basically, you know, remember Slain? It looked like mm -hmm. Slain, basically. And you played a character who was obviously designed to look like that character. But it was this... I loved it because I even... At that point i was just i was so into like mythology i loved stories of ancient greece and celtic mythology and all that stuff i loved it to bits i would always go to the library and get like books of mythology and read them cover to cover and what this what myth history in the making is it's basically like a roadmap of various different kinds of myth so in the first level, your character appears in a very sort of Christianic hell and uh, there's fire and flames everywhere. And you, what you've got to do, this is a really good example of like how oblique these games were. There are skeletons everywhere and there are these demon things sort of jumping about. And what you've got to do, there is a particular skeleton at the top of the level which is hung up by a chain from its wrist. What you need to do is get enough skeletons to spawn and kill enough of them that they drop a sword. Then you need to get the sword, you need to equip the sword, and you need to get close to that skeleton, and you need to perform this really weird... I can remember the manoeuvre even now, like, like you know, because we did it so often, where you have to bring the joystick from the left all the way to the right and press the fire button. Right. And if you did that, he would do, instead of doing the normal stab move, he would do this swipe and it would chop the chain off and the skeleton would fall down into the fire below. Now, initially, nothing would happen. So you're like, well, what did I do wrong? If you go down <laughs> to the edge of that fire and get the skeletons to rise again and swipe at their necks with the with that swipe move and knock a skull into the fire it causes this demon to rise up which <laughs> will then spawn a smaller demon which you can then kill to get a trident to kill the chimera that's at the end of the level to get out <laughs> so i think i got all that um... it's bonkers and all the levels are like that they're all themed around different myths so the second level is based on nordic mythology the third level is based on greek mythology and so on and so forth but all of them are like that you've got there are these very oblique strange maneuvers that you need to perform and weird things you need to do with items whereby if you don't get them right you're dead 
yeah. if you don't pick up in the Greek level, for example, there is this statue of Achilles that's got a shield. It looks like part of the background, but if you don't destroy the statue, how do you destroy the statue? By backswiping its heel, obviously. <laughs> obviously. If you don't destroy the statue, you don't get the shield. And if you don't get the shield, then you can't you can't defend yourself against Medusa, who's in the next level. Mm. And the game just lets you do it. It lets you die. <laughs> it just lets well, you go on and die, you know? What was it later, you know, or around that time in the 90s, uh, is it, was it the writers of Seinfeld had that maxim, no hugging, no learning? Mm. Um, I remember the Amiga being, you know, no, certainly no hugging, an awful lot of learning. An awful <laughs> in, in lot a hurry. of learning. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those games, I just, I could not get past, like, the first or second levels. Bart versus the Space Mutants. Do you remember the first level of that? Yeah, impossible. Uh, I, well, well, you at had least to... by the time you got to the second level, completely it, impossible. It was such a weird experience. So what the thing with Bart versus the Space Mutants is, you've got to. There are certain items you've got to collect or destroy in every level. And in the first level, for reasons that are best left up to the game designers, you have to destroy purple objects. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So and the way you do it, actually, it's really inventive. Looking back on it now, it's really inventive. So. You get, like, Bart's uh, then signature cans of spray paint. So you can spray paint a lot of the items. But others you can't. You've got to do these really elaborate things to destroy them. So there are, there's at one point the uh, houses that have purple blinds. Mm -hmm. And in order to get rid of them, what you need to do is go into one of the shops and buy fireworks and shoot the fireworks at the blinds. It's there's a lot of very elaborate stuff, and there's it's a even... lot of stuff that isn't really taken from The Simpsons, is it? I mean, it's I mean, it's using the environment of Springfield, but it's not really nah. it's not really in any organic way growing out of things that no. they would do on the show, apart not from Bart being a sort of delinquent, you know. Not at all. I mean, there's there are some elements that are directly from the show, but most of it, most of it is sort. You get the impression with a lot of these franchise video games that either the video games existed before and they've just stapled the franchise to it, or be they the people who designed the video games didn't have really much connection to the franchise and didn't really understand it and just made whatever they liked um but there are some things in the simpsons like for example um did you ever call mo oh yeah i so, sort of remember that yeah yeah if you go past mo's tavern in the first level there's a uh, phone booth and if you've managed to, co to collect a coin along the way you can actually go into the phone booth and call mo and get him to come out because one of the purple items is his apron right <laughs> which is <laughs> a, it, yeah. it's really cool isn't it? it's kind of really fun um but it was such an evil game yeah i remember a lot of sudden deaths on that yeah like and impossible jumps like flat out impossible jumps and it gets worse i mean i did manage i do remember i did manage to get off the first level once or twice and the second level the shopping mall is where you've got to you've got to destroy hats in that level yeah and you've got to do it by like knocking them off the heads of other springfielders and stuff yeah. like that um that level is a nightmare it's uh, it's oh i i just i remember being stunned when i, I probably it was probably about I was probably about 16 when I saw They Live, the John Carpenter movie on, yeah. on VHS. And it just went, when, when, you know, the, for people who don't know, the premise of They Live being that, you know, you, you put on special glasses that can let you see, like, the alien kind of infiltrators, overlords, you know. Uh -huh. uh, and I was just like, this is Bart Simpson versus the Space Yeah, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amongst the other thoughts I had about that film, I was like, whoa. Yeah, hey, be because, you know? of course, it's in the game, isn't it? I mean, there is the mechanic where you can put the sunglasses on and it tints the screen and you can see which Springfielders are actually aliens. Yeah, they've got, like, a, sort of energy orbs in their heads or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they've, they've got, got like, antennae, yeah. Yeah, like, tendrils or antennae coming out of their heads. Um, what I remember most, do you remember the animated intro? Yeah, it was like it was like the kind of Amiga equivalent of, a, of an FMV kind yeah. of uh, intro, wasn't it? Yeah. At the time, really impressive. Like, re you just never saw that sort of thing in video games. It even had like a potted version of the Simpsons theme tune on it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I I encountered like a lot of Amiga variants on sort of front, you know didn't think of them as like this at the time but you know franchises that i was into or kind of engaged mm -hmm. with like um do you remember there's an adams family game i do i had it it was it was good yeah yeah it was a you know gomez jumping around kind of essentially kind of the haunted house environment yeah you know, with guillotines coming down and stuff God, like that it was so hard yeah they, well they were all they were all hard <laughs> I don't yeah, I don't, yeah i don't remember it. i don't remember this is gonna make it sound like the game equivalent of the four yorkshireman sketch isn't it but yeah. I, I don't remember Luxury. i don't remember 
yeah, we used yeah we used to get up at four a.m. you know to, to, to play the Amiga. Yeah. Um, but it was just it was as you say it was just the learning curve was so steep. I mean, I, I was I was kind of obsessed with um, Rainbow Islands, and I think that's oh, that's God. one of the few games from that era I remember seeing before I got my own copy as well. Because yeah. the, the, the social element for me in terms of games came a bit later. Because I I think from that era I kind of remember. It was a, a couple of neighbor kids who had like I don't even know if they were Amigas, but they had mm-hmm. similar home computer sort of you know prototypes there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember seeing there was there was a mate of mine who had a Mega Drive, so I remember seeing Sonic, the original Sonic the Hedgehog around this time too. Of course, too. yeah, um, yeah. A Rainbow Islands. I used to have the sequel to that, Paracel Stars. Oh, is, yeah. You know what? You know what? I actually probably ended up playing more of that. Eventually. That was a that was a good game. I used to love Parasol Stars. Yeah. There's um I, I remember I again I could never even get anywhere close to finishing it, but I have watched a lot of these games on uh, long plays on YouTube <laughs> since that I never got to complete. And Parasol Stars is really good. There's like this whole it's not the case where you just go from level to level and complete them and go to the end of the game. There's this whole sub game within the game whereby if you collect certain items in certain orders it opens up secret doors mm. and there are secret worlds that open up that are really weird and full of strange imagery and it's really good well it was just it was such lovely graphics as well wasn't it and it's you know it might be more typical of what you were saying it was kind of euro platformers you know but like um i because i think it's funny right because because i sort of just obliquely mentioned sonic mm. but um i was kind of it's so hard to think back to an era when the aesthetics of what you might call the, the major video game franchises and stars and everything were, were kind of not in my head yet or if they were right. they were in very basic form so like if you'd asked six seven year old it's a seven year old me say if you'd asked him what mario looked like mm-hmm. uh, what i'd what i'd be describing was the original nes game yeah and, and that's and that's you know obviously that's an iconic look in all kinds of ways and it's a mm-hmm. fantastic it's a design classic you know on, on every level but but that's that's the look of it it's not i wouldn't have been describing the relatively sumptuous you know super yeah. mario world or anything like that of course so, Ra- so rainbow islands compared to that looked like a you know like, like a titian or something you yeah. know it was, it, was, it was crazy you know like yeah. the amount of colors and everything and well i mean this is something people forget about the amiga it really was like a technical powerhouse there was stuff on that system i mean i didn't appreciate it at the time because it was just video games you know it was it was just my first experience but i remember getting a copy of turrican 2 which is generally considered to be like one of the technical highlights of that era um it's a stunner of a game that is i mean looking back at it now i can't believe it was even on the amiga what was that so I, I i've heard the name but what oh turrican 2 turrican 2 is a it's an action science fiction game that has elements of like metroid about it but it's much more faster paced right um it's infamous these days not only for being like a technical marvel but for having one of the best soundtracks on the amiga right right it's uh chris Hulesbeck is the um the composer and he is infamous for that era he he did some of the best soundtracks of the era uh basically and um Turrican 2 is generally regarded as one of the best the music is still great mm. it's still amazing but it's just that everything about that game is just class you know it's just beautiful it's responsive it's quick it's fast-paced the levels are huge and elaborate and beautiful and the it's got scary boss monsters in it that are genuinely threatening and unpleasant. Right. Um, it's a stunner that is. I mean, at the time, I, it was one of my favourite games. But it, you know, obviously, it's you don't consciously appreciate the technical elements. You just think it's a good game, you know. Yeah. But looking back on it now, it's a marvel. It's an absolute technical marvel. On the sort of um, sci-fi adventure level, because I, I made a note of a couple of games that I didn't have any experience with, but I thought you might have done. Mm-hmm. Or I thought it was worth asking anyway. Did you did you play any Alien Breed? Oh my god, yeah! Alien Breed scared the living shit out of me. Yeah, because that looked. I just watched some some let's plays of that um, this afternoon, and that looks um, better than some Alien video games that I was playing well into the mid nineties. Right. <laughs> I mean, it was originally um, right. Apparently, Alien Breed right up until the like the. F- a few weeks before release that was going to be an alien game like an official alien yeah it's like not, an official it's not, alien it? game but they did it for some reason the the franchise fell through they couldn't get the copyright so they had to very quickly and not much really redesign the monsters yeah i was it. gonna say not much <laughs> not much they look just like the alien but no that scared the living hell out of me alien breed did the uh, the opening sequence that descending note you get, and then like the face of the monster cut. Ah, it scared me to death. Oh, it really so did. 
I, it's funny, of, so funny, you know, you know, in the in the preamble, um, we were talking about very briefly about Philip K. Dick. Um, mm-hmm. I did, I spotted also that there was a Total Recall tie-in game. There was, there was, which wasn't terrible. Total Recall was actually all right. It's kind of like a platformer game. Mm. It's okay. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not amazing, but it's okay. Um, but I do remember, like, my our Amiga, we moved it up into this the, the, a little room which was on the front of the house and it was always really cold and really dark <laughs> so, yeah. and i remember spending hours up there like hours and hours lost in these games lost in my own imagination um and some of the horror games because i mean this is another weird thing like horror games were not a thing back then horror games were just not like an established thing in fact the notion of horror in video games often caused a little bit of a furor in british culture you know Mm. when Mm. that started happening on the video game consoles Mm. like the mega drive there are often tabloid articles you know i ban this filth and whatnot well because this is just before mortal kombat and stuff right the amiga had an established horror genre on it because the because the computer was aimed more at like an adult audience it could get away with it. So you had games like Alien Breed, for example, which were based on classic horror franchises. There was even a British company called Horrorsoft that produced some really good horror RPGs based on, of all things, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Right. (laughs) She actually became the face of that company. I can imagine Um, Elvira getting in on that kind of thing. She kind of, she kind of did. You know, she lent her her, her image to the franchise. Go and look up the... um, the long plays of Elvira and Elvira to the Jaws of Cerberus on the Amiga. They're horror games, and they're actually really nasty. There's this whole shtick where they've gone for, like, full-on nasty death scenes. Every single way you can die in that game has this really unpleasant animation or image involved with it that's gross. Mm. It's gory, it's violent, it's deeply unpleasant. They also did another game in a similar vein called Waxworks, which is properly scary. Mm. Very good horror games. The one I always remember, though, the one that really got me was... Uh, did you ever play Darkseed? I think, yeah, I think I, did. I at least played a demo of that. The uh, the one that's based on H.R. Giga's art. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah, that's coming back to me. Scared the living daylights out of me, that did. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, what I was saying before about like unsupervised play, you know, because mm-hmm. um, this is I don't know, you know, obviously our parents probably had different rules and, and mm-hmm. amounts of time on the hand to, uh, from day to day and stuff. But um, I, I, I had quite um, my parents usually would supervise me watching kind of edgy movies and mm-hmm. things like that, you know, up, up, up until I don't know, the age of nine, ten, something yeah, like that, you yeah. know, uh, whereas that wasn't the attitude they took with the Amiga, probably because they thought nope. it was kind of a safe space in a way. Yes, you know? they didn't realise what was actually on it at times. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming I used that with any, you know, fervour to get away with stuff or anything. Like that. It was mm-hmm. just, it was just the fact I just, like you've been describing, I just was exposed to a lot of stuff that was pretty brutal and kind yeah. of, you know, I mean, I mean, this is the thing, like, you know, so if we go right back to the core of it, because because this is such an early formative gaming experience for both of us, like the idea, <laughs> the idea of setting your kid, you know, in this this play area. Where what will happen is they will die over and over again. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of fucked up, isn't it? Kind of is, yeah, in its own strange way. I mean, and a lot of those games were actually kind of scary, even when they weren't meant to be. There is because of the crudity of a lot of the renderings and the imperfections that they contain. There is often like an uncanny valley quality to them. Mm. That's really quite disturbing. I remember one of my favourite games for the Amiga, one that I I first encountered in one of the magazines. I often this often happened where I would see like a guide or um, like an advert for a game, and it would just capture my imagination. In one of the issues of Amiga Action, there was this guide for a game called Harlequin. Um, oh, I remember Harlequin. Yeah, and yeah, it, I played loads of that. The imagery of that just like got me you know i remember reading like the background for it do you remember the story of harlequin not really no, it's gorgeous no. it's actually it's one i i want to recreate in a novel at some point you know of my own it's about um, a fantasy world called chimerica chimerica is like a giant clock it's massive it's like a city mm-hmm. um and it's the imaginary world. it's like neverland it's the imaginary world of a single boy who grows up there the metaphysics of that i love for one thing a boy who grows up in a world of his own imagination and when he grows up he leaves chimerica 
and he forgets it and he goes and has a life in the normal world he, you know he grows up he goes and has a job and whatnot and later in his life he hears the dying chimes of chimerica and remembers and goes back to it as an adult and finds that all the doors are locked and everything is dusty and dark and corrupt and it's it's the world of his imagination slowly decaying and giving way to like the corruption of adulthood and that's what you're playing that's so weird because i i um uh, even in my troll today and yesterday i didn't come across harlequin and it hadn't popped back into my head but now mm-hmm. i probably played that a lot more than a lot of the games i've noted down you know yeah. honestly i remember that and i remember that being quite challenging as well and, oh you know, it was so a lot difficult. of difficult uh, platforming you know well one of the things uh, one of the things with harlequin i mean i've gone back and watched it since it's that it's it's a it's a kind of it's as close to an open world game as the the amiga could get so there were certain like early on there were certain set routes but after a particular point in the game you can move around the different realms of chimerica which are all realms of like a child's imagination that have been distorted and corrupted in pretty much any way you see fit to solve all of the puzzles and to open all of the doors and whatnot you've basically got to go around flipping switches and every switch does something. They often like set up. A, they open a new gateway, or they open a new door in another level, or whatever. Mm. Um, and it's really beautiful. It reminds me very much of a later game, which was American McGee's Alice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, friend of uh, mine called Drew has, has played a lot of that. Yeah. It's got a very sort of similar theme about it, where it's a distorted imagination. It's a distorted psychoscape. Um, I get the impression with Harlequin that the developers had a vision for that game that the the technical parameters of the time just didn't allow for. They wanted it to be bigger. They wanted it to be something more. I would love to see someone pick up that franchise now. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be Man. fascinating yeah, to see to see that if, if that had moved into the sixty four era in the same way right. that other things did. Yeah. I, you, you, did you ever stumble across a game called Tanks? This is a uh, Tanks with an X at the end. No, I don't remember that one. That was another. One. It wasn't quite Lemmings like in the in the way the whole family gathered around it, but I definitely remember playing it with my dad. And because my dad had this kind of, in retrospect, very adorable kind of um, role when he was playing computer games with me and my <laughs> brother. That were, you know, they were they were as novel to him as they were to us. You know, it wasn't yeah. like he was gaming in the early eighties or anything like that. Uh-huh. But um. He, he kind of settled into the role of, like, manager. It was yeah. like a parenting coach. <laughs> so he'd, like, you know, I remember him, like, uh, encouraging me on in, the, like, the time trials in F-Zero X and things like that, you know, yeah, later yeah. on in, in, in the decade. But um, Tanks was a really sim. If anyone remembers it, it would be fascinating to see if this has a sort of, you know, fan fan culture because <laughs> Tanks basically you had two tanks parked at other at opposite ends of this rugged landscape with loads of hills and lakes huh. and stuff in the way. And then you basically just had to fire the gun at each other. <laughs> but, 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 but the... Um, the, the wind was was up and, and like the wind would vary and you know like it does in many games like you know, it would vary from move to move and, and you'd have to get through or over these mountains and basically you had to it was a lot of trial and error but it yeah. was tense trial and error because you knew the other guy was trial and erroring as well right so it, so, so it was just you know were you going to get him first it was like a duel basically yeah that sounds fun uh, it sounds uh, very much like dynamically similar to games like worms yeah it kind it kind of was yeah because you could move the tanks a little bit but not uh-huh. much, you know, and you, you could kind of dodge. And I think I think it was probably designed for kind of whatever the equivalent of online gaming was in the early nineties, right, you know, the sort course. of network stuff in computer labs and things, you know. But yeah. uh, but you know, we 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 were just mech- mucking about with it, playing against the CPU and stuff oh, like that. But that was brilliant. That, that was I'm I'm really going to track uh, down a, a YouTube clip of that if I can because that was great. I'm going to have a look for that because I don't. I'm I mean I wonder now did I ever play it because they I might have played it on like a demo or something and forgotten. But I I'm going to have a look for that. You know, we were talking about the uh, aesthetics of Amiga platform games versus, like, you know, sort of what you might call the emerging mainstream. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever dabble in Zool? Yeah, of course. I mean, who, who, who? You know, do you remember when Zool like started to hit the store shelves, and they really pushed it, didn't they? Yeah, they sure did. They wanted Zool to be like, because mascots were the thing. Once, once the Mega Drive hit, and once the once the Super Nintendo hit, mascots were the thing. Every video game console or computer had to have a mascot. So they tried to market Zool as the Sonic beater, didn't they? You know, it was, mm. it was meant to be faster. It was meant to be punchier. It was never quite that, I don't think. But I, I really liked Zool. Yeah. Well, it is laughably fast. I mean, like it's kind of game breakingly fast. Yeah, it's like ways. it's so fast that sometimes he actually does run off the screen. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Because oh, actually, so- Sonic, for all its hype at the time, is actually quite a cogent gaming experience, whereas oh, yeah. it's, all, it's always almost like breaking the system in, in you playing uh, it, you know? Yeah, you know. just a little bit. Just a little bit. And also, they di- I mean, obviously, they didn't quite get the, the level design in the same way that the designers of Sonic did. So the levels are designed around Sonic speed in the early Sonic games. Well, the, the good ones are, anyway. The yeah. good ones, yeah. Zool, not so much. Because Zool is a Euro platformer. In the, it's got all of the hallmarks of a Euro platformer. You know, you've got to collect certain amounts of the sweets in every level to get off the level. Mm. So you can't really marry that to the speed because you've got to stop and start exploring, you know? Really? Um, but I liked Zool quite a lot. It was good fun. Well, it's like you were saying, you know, like these these genres. Because I think in terms of Nintendo gaming, for example, I think the the NES or the NES is is kind of a big boiling pot of kind uh-huh. of genre definitions in a way, isn't yeah. it? Like a lot of a lot of genres getting worked out and inve- you know invented in many cases, but at least mm-hmm. finessed. And then you know the the nineties, you might say, is, is more of a period of kind of um, consolidation, at least yeah, until the, the sort much. of great great leaps forward of of, of the mid nineties. But um, but you know, it's it's it's. It's like you're saying, like you know, the, these the, a lot of these genres aren't baked yet, or, or a lot of them are sort of evolutionary dead ends as well. Yeah, know? yeah. There's a lot of games on the Amiga where there just isn't anything like them. Mm. They, they didn't go anywhere for for better or for worse. You know, there were certain gaming conventions that certainly died on the Amiga and have never ever been resurrected. Um, that whole thing of like having to explore levels to collect items to progress and you have to do it you got you there's no way around it that is something that's often been foregone now it's 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 because it's it's frustrating and it's often very annoying yeah well that well that link is through at least into the 64 days wasn't it with sort of the dungeons of zelda and stuff of course and i I, I actually actually have limited uh patience with some of that kind of gameplay like i mean i i i'd say i'm a zelda i'm I'm not green of time fan but i'm kind of a a tentative fan of the dungeon element really yeah yeah i mean um i always remember there was a game called a first samurai do you remember that was that, was that an Amiga thing? It was an Amiga thing, yeah. And it's got a great mythology and background to it, and also a kind of great attitude. It's got it's it's like it's an action fantasy game where you play as the eponymous samurai, but it's also got this great sense of humor <laughs> behind it as well. Yeah. So the whole thing is where you you it's it's a side scrolling platformer essentially, but like a lot of the platformers on the Amiga, the levels are huge. They're massive and sprawling, and you've got to explore like underground caverns and whatnot. And it's always with a view to collecting four of a particular item on each level that allow you to traverse a hazard. So in the first level, there's a giant waterfall that you can't leap over. If you try to leap over it, you fall down and you die. What you've got to collect are four logs, and then you can use the logs to cross the stream to get to the boss. They're hidden all over the level, and you've got to... uh, fight off like giant animated statues and giant spiders and all sorts of things it's a great game but it does have this wryness underneath it like this this bizarre sense of humor so to restore the samurai's health you've got to find like picnic baskets that are littered around everywhere (laughs) for some reason for god knows why but there you are when you hit them you get the strains of hallelujah coming through (laughs) it's so silly Uh, but kind of funny you know it's got a good sense of humor about it loved that game loved it to bits that's so cool i mean i i I mean a lot of humor was kind of in those games and stuff wasn't it i mean like i don't i i I never really played monkey island but um (gasps) monkey island was one of those games that i actually remember having word of mouth you know, and like, 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 and I think uh, probably at a fairly early primary school level for me, you know, so like, yeah. uh, kind of, you know, going into kind of year three, year four, kind of level. Legendary. You know, where, 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 yeah, because people, I mean, people were impressed with the script, you know, yeah. they might have put it that way, but that, I think that's a lot what people liked about it, is they liked the cheekiness of it, they liked well, the wit I, of it. I think people were just surprised, to be honest, because I don't think comedy is one of those things where even now comedy is a rare commodity in a lot of video games you know you don't often get like laugh out loud funny video games it's often Mm. by accident when they are funny it's like your resident evil you know the original resident evil with its terrible script that's absolutely hilarious monkey island i remember being the first video game that made me laugh Mm, yeah 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 like, yeah well I, I, it's, it's equally challenging isn't it you know to make people laugh in a sort of family friendly context you know absolutely yeah i mean it's never like it's never it never goes 
over the over the parameters. It's, it's, it goes near the knuckle a couple of times, but it never steps over. They are family-friendly video games. Um, and very, 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 very funny indeed. My, my sort of steps into the Monkey Island genre, as you might call it, was ca- actually came a little bit later, you know, when, um, do you remember they did a Discworld one? Yeah, but they yeah. had the Monty Python cast in them. That's right, yeah, yeah. Was it, was it like, written by Eric Idle? Or that? Or Eric I Idle up, played... Uh, by Eric, Idle. <laughs> Eric Idle played Rincewind. So That's he was like, right, yeah, yeah, he was the main character, yeah. That was catnip for me at that point. I think that was the, actually the Sega Saturn version that I played briefly, which <laughs> yeah, nice. really, really limits you to the timescale there, because it was, you know, the one time anyone in my neighbourhood had a Sega Saturn. I was going to say, my God, I only knew one person who ever had a Sega Saturn. Everyone only knew one person who had a Sega Saturn, George. Yeah, I know. That was was the problem. (laughs) It's a shame, really. I think, I mean, I know that Sega were really boneheaded about the release and development of the Sega Saturn. They really were. They made so many errors. More than I ever thought. I mean, I I watched a couple of documentaries about about the development and marketing of the Sega Saturn, and it's, it's insane. It, the decisions they made with that console were just mad. Didn't they do stuff like not? I mean, I, I only looked into this in recent years as well because I just, you know, I, I was, it was kind of a laugh line for for many years for me and my friends. But like, uh, did didn't they like not have a Sonic game for the launch yeah. and things like that? Like, yeah, um, Jap- like Sega of Japan have always had this separation from Sega in the West, and in Japan, Sonic's big but he's nowhere near as big as he was in the western markets it certainly wasn't the case that sonic was like as positively identified with sega as he became here Mm -hmm. so here of course the notion of releasing a sega console without a sonic game at launch Mm. was madness well because he was he was the nut they had to crack america wasn't he It was a deliberate right. strategy to to sell consoles in a big yeah. way so it's like how could they unlearn that lesson in, right i mean do you, you remember know? like uh you know for the when the it was the mega drives era that was their entire advertising campaign in the uk in europe and in the usa the whole thing was that sonic was cool mario is not Mm, yeah that was yeah, and they the pushed whole that aggressively, shtick. didn't they? Yeah. yeah it was the whole shtick so to have pushed that so aggressively to have created a culture where sonic was was sega the face of sega was sonic and that was it in the west um to not understand that and to release the sega saturn without a sonic game to go mm-hmm. was absolute insanity you know talking of cool and to pull it back to the amiga mm. do you remember a game called walker Oh my god, do I? Yeah, by DMA. Yeah, I, I remember Walker. I played so much, so much Walker. That and, was uh, amazing. That was, was a. It's funny you should say by DMA actually, because because um you know I was re I was also as part as well as replaying Lemmings recently. I was replaying Lemmings oh, two, course, which yeah. we're chatting about, and I'm sure in the it, I think it's in the Space Tribe in Lemmings two, uh, mm-hmm. the Walker from Walker shows up mm-hmm. in like, the level artwork. Yeah. They did that a lot in Lemmings, actually. In the um, in the original Lemmings, there's a level called A Beast of a Level. And A Beast of a Level is completely different from every other level in the game. It uses different assets, it has different music, it has different visuals, and it uses the assets and music from Shadow of the Beast. Right, got you. Which was one of the big sellers for Psygnosis at the time. So like this sort of like in jokes, you know, in the same way that you'd have Loads. like you know, kind of uh, in in like horror franchises and stuff, you'd have like you know, the Wolfman showing up in uh, you know a Frankenstein yeah. picture or something. Yeah. I mean, Lemmings has got loads, absolutely loads, and you need to. I mean, if you look up a list on the internet of all the in jokes that are in Lemmings, it just goes on and on and on mm. and on and on. There's tons of them. I remember the, the, yeah. the aesthetics of Walker were just great. I mean, like for for a kid at the time as well, because you know, there's the, some cerebral stuff on the Amiga and some kind of you know mm. quite cutesy stuff and you know inventive stuff and everything. But Walker was just badass. Oh, bit, Walker was it? a stunner. And a very unique game as well. You had to use both the joystick and the mouse for that one. Yeah, to aim, right? You had to yeah, aim with the mouse. so like... In a, very the, PC, in a very proto-PC kind of way, really. Very strange. Like, so the joystick would move the Walker backwards and forwards, and the mouse would move its head mm. so you could aim with it. And the Walker itself was pseudo-3D. Yeah, it was kind of like a, a bit like, uh, probably deliberately so, it was a bit like the ED-309 out of Robocop, wasn't it? It was that yeah. kind of, although it made that mixed with one of the sort of chicken walkers from Star Wars. Very gory as well. Yeah, it was, it was it was horrendously gory, wasn't it? Like you were like blowing away like legions of soldiers. That, I can't remember what on earth the plot was, but it was that kind of I think of, it know... was a time travel plot. I think you were like sent back in time through various eras and you had to fight, I think in the first level it's Nazis, in one of the levels it's someone right. else and so on. <laughs> Do you think so Walker's re- 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 you know, overdue like a Wolfenstein-esque um, reappreciation? Oh, God, that would be fun, wouldn't it? 
that would be a <laughs> Don't lot Don't punch a Nazi, fun. walk all over them. Yeah, I was going to say, anything, well, anything where you get to, like, shoot Nazis and they explode into, like, like just just ridiculous pu- puddles of blood. It's fine yeah. by me. Me and my um, brother love, love that. We weren't particularly more um, adept at playing it than any other the other games, but we definitely had a good go. It I was mean, hard. Walker was really difficult. I, I remember the like demo was pretty much unbeatable. <laughs> there were <laughs> lovely <laughs> little details as well. Like you know the little sprites, the little men, because the walker was massive, it was huge. If the little men who were the enemies, if they got close to the walker, they could grapple up onto it. So they'd throw ropes and with hooks up and they could climb up and plant bombs on it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was oh, so that was cool. terrific. That, you know you know what a lot of these games kind of, you know, I'm quite happy to leave them in the past as actual gameplay experiences. Definitely. I mean, I like can find um, an emulator for Walker. I've I've got the Win UAE emulator working, and um, a lot of the games that I played as a kid, which I really enjoyed, it's a no. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's it's a big fat no. They're just they're just frustrating, and I don't have the patience that I used to have. Uh, some of them don't are... want to go back to these really eccentric experiences that feel a bit more personal as well, do you? Because like this, I think I think if you replay, I don't know, Sonic Two or whatever, mm. it, it's okay to revisit that, knowing that it's yeah. a fairly generic childhood experience for millions and millions of people, you know. Whereas mm. this Amiga, so I'm not I'm not making it out like we were the only people to ever play the Amiga, <laughs> of it, but th- th- these do feel a bit more special, doesn't it? Like because because when you mentioned Harlequin, then that brought back like yeah. months of my life that I mm-hmm. that I'd forgotten about, you know. That's it, isn't it? I mean, it's because they are the first and because they're the earliest, there is this incredible association, isn't there? It, the, for me, the images, the environments, the music is burned into my memory and into my brain and must have influenced my imagination in very significant ways. I sometimes catch myself when I'm writing stories with images coming up that are so from these video games. Hmm. It's it's incredible to think. I even remember stupid stuff like a wolf child, for example. I remember the cheat that gives you infinite ammo. I don't know why I remember that. <laughs> you have to type in on the title screen "soul psychedelicide," right? <laughs> and that gives you infinite ammo. God knows why I remember that. Do you remember a game that was made for comic relief called Sleepwalker? No, I don't. <laughs> there was a game called Sleepwalker that had the voice of Lenny Henry in it. <laughs> No, you're just making this up now. No, I, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And the plot involves a young boy who sleepwalks and his dog. And the dog is trying to get him home without him getting hurt. It's very funny. Very silly. Um, but in that, the, the, there's a cheat that allows you to skip levels. And <laughs> you have to type on the title screen, my ding-a-ding-dang, my dang a long a ling long <laughs> And that will allow you to skip levels. I don't know why I remember that. You know, you know. I I wonder if I tweeted at Lenny Henry. Like, do you do you remember Sleepwalker? Oh my God, that would be so interesting. Because I imagine I imagine most people have forgotten it completely. But yeah. that would be really interesting. But it was made to coincide with Comic Relief. At, at that year, Comic Relief four went the red noses and did Tomatoes instead. I remember that. Yeah. yeah and the Tomatoes that. are like big imagery in Sleepwalker. Um. That's so weird. A, a tie-in game for a charity, mm-hmm. you know, a fam- famine charity relief telethon. Very strange. And, like, it's so strange for if you go back to revisit it, isn't it? Because those cultural touchstones, if you don't know them, it just makes certain elements of the game weird. Mm. Like, why is it... What does that mean? Why is it there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, I mean, just very loads of specific things about that kind of computer game culture in the in the nineties. I mean, we won't stray too much into the late nineties, you know, but mm-hmm. it's kind of. I, I remember this, this is more true of like early PC magazines, really. But mm-hmm. my when we got a PC, I think the first one was with Windows ninety five. It was somewhere in that Windows ninety five to ninety eight zone. Um, we my dad started getting pc magazines right. and me and my brother were fascinated by them and my mum found them and she you know obviously she had two like proto adolescent boys on her hands uh-huh. here and she was like what are these magazines you guys are getting because they all had sexy women on the oh, covers yeah yeah and she's like what you know often in bikinis and stuff like that mm-hmm. and, and we, she's like what i think she thought she was basically um stumbling on a sort of fhm-esque proto yes, porn stash. yeah and and we were like no no it's just you know like we we, we didn't even know we should be embarrassed with it. we we're just like no right. this is just but i think even when i was kind of 
a little bit older, like 12, 13, I was like, wow, these are really sexualized magazines. Right, like, right. That that really started to happen when you got like the next generation of consoles. You know, when, when video gaming itself grew, started to grow up. It, it, mm-hmm. it, it's that's the phenomenon we were talking about earlier. And like the, the medium of video games has grown up as we have. So as we were going through our adolescence, it was going through its adolescence as well. So yeah. suddenly you, you did get like the, the Lara Croft. late 90s. Yeah, the Lara Crofts. Yeah. You got the, like the, uh, yeah the scantily clad beat em up characters who are all over the magazines at that point yeah it's sort of the cliche of people starting to play well i mean this is part of the playstation sort of marketing and brand wasn't mm-hmm. it but like the kind of the cli- the cultural cliche of people who now are playing games when they come back from the pub right right so like the playstation very much in the uk was marketed at demographics that traditionally didn't play video games that's another weird thing, isn't it? Like, video games, I, in this era, video games were such a niche thing. They were often the purview of anoraks, you know, of mm, people yeah. who are, you know, kids who are a little bit geeky, who were into, like, fantasy and mythology and D&D and reading and that kind of thing. There was a, a distinct cultural separation between the children who liked football and acrobatics and whatnot and the kids who liked books and video games. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, on on my podcast show, we 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 covered uh, space back in January. Um, right. and we met John, and you know, but by, by that that comes out in '99, and you've you've got this kind of it kind of tying into the PlayStation thing. And I think the PlayStation is the video game console that's most um, um, currently displayed in space, most mm-hmm. frequently displayed. And then you have the character of Tim, who's this you know uh, man child kind of figure who yeah. who but who has brought video games into his adulthood. You know, and and, and they but also the visual language of space draws on video games as much as it draws on films and tv doesn't it to show right. you that you know the, the, the audience is at least the sort of center of the audience is, is expected to understand these references at least a little bit um, yeah and of course now that's escalated to the point whereby video game consoles are just part of people's households mm. you know it's it is not um an unseemly or strange thing for like people our age to have the next console or whatever and to enjoy video games and whatnot um it's a fascinating phenomena and of course video games themselves have grown up in many distinct and varied ways to the point whereby now they are very literate artifacts you know they Mm. are these collections of various forms of art be it the music the aesthetics the themes they deal with it's fascinating They, they you know they they are texts now It'd be really interesting because you know, although we're fans, neither you or I actually you know, do game design or anything like that. Um, I, as far as I know, anyway, George. No, but, no, uh, not at but, the but, moment. But, but I, yeah, well, uh, yeah, there. Um, but um, I, it'd be actually be really interesting to see people roughly our age, you know, who now work in the video game mm. industry, and uh, were, you know, were, were equally had had amigas, and that, that they took some of those those ideas into, um, you know, in, into into life like that. Well, it is um, fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I um, one of the things I like at the moment on YouTube is looking at the the sort of history of this era and how, like, some of the small independent developers from the era who were just like coding things in their bedroom went on to found some of the really big video game companies later. Um, you had the creation of moguls in this era, so like Peter Molyneux, mm-hmm. who is infamous. You know, he's one of the great grandsires of of entire genres of video gaming came out of this era. Populous. I mean, he created Populous. He created the God Sim. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing to think. I remember having Populous. You know, I remember having... I didn't understand it under the time because it was... It, that, that was definitely one of... It was like Sim City. you know? One of those games that's a little bit more adult, that's aimed at an adult audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, re- I remember that. Yeah, I think that was a bit too too rich for my blood back. Yeah, then. I, I liked it. it. I remember liking it and being fascinated by it, but not understanding how it worked. Are you uh, are you aware of a bloke called um, Stuart Campbell? Stuart Campbell? No, that doesn't ring a bell. It might it might when I contextualise him a bit more. So um, he he's most famous now because he's uh, a scottish political blogger who uh, blogs under the name wings over scotland right and he is a big figure in the current factionalism that's going on between um the smp and alba up there right. um it is I'll, I'll let you you know <laughs> read up about him but <laughs> basically the, the thing i knew about him when i started paying attention to his work because he, he he's he's someone who evokes strong feelings i won't get into the factionalism that he represents but he's mm. he's he a lot of people like him, a lot of people don't like him, and, and as far as I'm concerned, have good cause to. In his political life, 
in his former life, he was an Amiga um, journalist t- turned game developer. Right. Um, so he wrote for Amiga Power between 91 and 94. I, I, I was date checking <laughs> this today. Um, but he later got, um, he was known for extremely caustic reviews. Right. Um, okay. he, he, he like almost pioneered that style of, style of like, I guess it's like gonzo game journalism, or at least he yeah. was known in Britain for that. And you know, a lot of <laughs> game developers got influenced by him. So a lot of the N64, like I, I used to get N64 magazine and stuff, you know, um, mm-hmm. in the late 90s, a lot of the funniest reviews in that I liked were things like, you know, they'd review a new uh, MK, a Mortal Kombat game, and I think one of the quotes was, you know, it's it's worse than falling off a cliff and surviving. Yeah, and that's yeah. A, that's not a Stuart Campbell line, but it's a very Stuart Campbell esque line. Got but, you, um, got but, you. But he got hired. Um, he got hired for to work for I think it was Sensible or um, one of their offshoots. Right, uh, God, so he, one of the big companies, yeah. Yeah, and he, he went on to program. I think was it one of the Cannon fodder games and like right, uh, like later versions of Sensible Soccer. Um, so sport, huge sports games were never my thing, really. So but, like um, the bigger, but they are. I mean, I, I nor mine. I not my thing at all. But they were huge on the Amiga. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, but 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 it's as I say, it's Phew, excuse very, me. Div- very very divisive figure in Scottish politics at the moment. But right. um, has this fascinating hinterland in in sort of <laughs> era me. gaming and actually, as I say, sort of codified a lot of the kind of more i wouldn't exactly say laddish but kind of the more aggressive hyperbolic kind of game reviewing God, style that's that... fascinating isn't it that is absolutely fascinating because i mean i uh, as i say i used to get amiga action and the thing that people didn't used to like about amiga action was that it was very fawning uh, because it was like computer system specific mm. it often used to exaggerate its reviews you know so you had to you had to take into context if a if a game got like 60 percent it was probably a 30 percent game yeah got you yeah you know that kind of thing that was, um, a, that was the thing in game culture wasn't it like there was every magazine portrayed itself as the truth teller and they yeah. and they, they also stymied their rivals as like you know they always tarred them as like you know they're the they're the fawning ones they're the, they're the sort of court jesters here you know i mean it even got nastier between some of the rival magazines there's some great documentaries that look at it on youtube there's a youtuber by the name of kim justice and uh, she off she tends to look at this era of video games and she she not only looks at the games but she also looks at the culture behind them so she looks at the magazine she looks into the companies and what was going on behind the scenes and some of those documentaries are fascinating like the amiga there's a great documentary she did about the history of the amiga and you know do you remember when the amiga died well <laughs> no and and the way it left our lives was it, it it wasn't really like one of those big turning points where you mm. sort of trade in a console for another yeah. console or anything like that it just sort of faded out of our lives it sort of <laughs> sidestepped out of it i think i think what yeah. eventually my dad would have done with ours was 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 sell it i think would yeah. be something like loot or something because basically me and my brother had moved on to to the more conventional uh, or emerging conventional uh sega and nintendo consoles and that's exactly what happened to us i mean i got my sega yeah. mega drive uh for one christmas can't remember which one and as a result of that the amiga kind of just sat doing very little for the longest time and after that i got a super nintendo and then it just that was it really so but i i do find that phenomena fascinating the fact that there would have been a last time that we sat down in whatever cold room where the amiga was and that would have been the last time. I mean, we wouldn't have known, you know, we would have no concept yeah. of it. Quite melancholy, really. There is it? a there is a wonderful kind of bittersweet melancholy to that, um, given that it was such a formative experience. Well, I think um, Lemmings 2 was one of the... I mean, you know... The, again experts will know better than me but i think lemmy's 2 was pretty late in the day you know Very like that, was, late. that was that was certainly one of like the last games that you'd say had a, kind of a cultural footprint i guess yeah definitely i mean it's such a shame though the amiga was still riding high when it was cancelled you know when right. commodore folded and the amiga apparently is such a mutable system that it could still have been going strong now with mm-hmm. add-ons and you know new developments and whatnot. I mean, there are even like companies, little homegrown companies that still use it. They still produce new chipsets and things for it that allow it to function in the modern era, in the present mm-hmm. day era, which is amazing to think, isn't it? But Commodore itself was involved in such shady, ham-fisted shenanigans that it just collapsed. It just utterly collapsed in on itself. Bad decision after bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. And eventually it just died. I remember like it being a shock to me when we got an issue of Amiga Action. Because Amiga Action was the very first, like... It was the first publication I ever got, like, through the door. Mm-hmm. 
and it was it was a staple for the longest time when we got an issue that was the last issue and it had a big gravestone on the front saying r.i.p amiga from mm. such and such a date to such and such a date and i remember like slightly panicky saying what does this mean to my mom you know um and we, we you know we read the articles and commodore had folded so there was no there was just no more that they just weren't producing anymore i i think the last this is a silly analogy but i like silly analogies i, I always think the uh the last game the, the last days of you know particular games console or sort of games companies dominance they often feel a bit like that bit in the godfather 2 you know when <laughs> michael goes to cuba um you know and you've got all these people making these grand plans and passing around golden telephones uh-huh. right up to the last moment right up to the moment when the sort of embassy gets stormed essentially yeah pretty and it's much just, uh, you know and in this case stormed by the by the, the big companies you know it's uh i mean it, that was about the same time as the graveyard of the atari jaguar and stuff wasn't pretty it well? much yeah i mean the sad thing is there was still a market there were still people who loved their amiga and there's still people waiting you know what the big question at the time was will doom come to the amiga right right that was yeah. the big question at the time and the, the amiga could have done it Oh, it yeah. could have it could have run Doom, and there were plans. There were plans to port Doom to the Amiga to get the Amiga on the internet. Even can you imagine? Yeah, that was that's quite a weird um, parallel universe. Isn't it? Right, and it just it just didn't happen. Unfortunately, it is such a shame because the, the, the there was life in that system. It could yeah. have still been a player, and it could. Can you imagine what? I mean, it sounds weird to say, but. If the Amiga had gone on and if it had continued to evolve into like the 32-bit era and maybe even beyond, then British culture would have been different because we would have still had a homegrown video game industry. Yeah, I suppose that's, that's unknowable, really, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I kind of, you know, I, I got quite in, uh, you know, it wasn't that I just became a console player and stopped playing, you mm. know, what, what became PCs. I, I was quite into PC gaming in the late <laughs> 90s, um, but yeah, it wasn't likewise. the same thing at all, was it? You know, I mean, the, nah. the, the, the CD-ROMs you got on magazines were not the same kind of beast as those blue discs. Nothing. No, no they were very different. They were very different beasties indeed. Uh, and the whole experience was kind of different, really. Um, I just remember so much that was textural about the Amiga as well. Like, like the way it would get really hot. Yes. Like, really <laughs> damn hot. And then it would start to smell of, like, burning out electronics. Yeah, yeah, that can't have been safe. Can that it? can't have been good, no. It cannot have been good. The noise it used to make. When it was loading up, like, the little red light would flash and it would go... Eh! Yeah, and the little and, click of securing the disc as well. Yeah, brilliance, absolute brilliance. And each different game had its own like loading tune almost, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so weird. It's such a strange thing to think. I mean, if if computers made that noise now, you'd take them back and assume they were broken. Oh, you'd probably have them destroyed, like uh, a train station, you know, just to, right. <laughs> just <laughs> to be sure, yeah? yeah, just to be sure. Um, but back then, again, it's because we didn't have any context. That was just the way it was. That was just the way it was. So, like, yeah, sometimes you had to pause, like, partway through a game to put in the next disc and wait for it to load. Yeah, well, I mean, just the, the, the amount of space the monitor would have taken up as well. Oh, it was I mean, it's massive, a... weren't it? That's always bizarre, isn't it, when you see, like, period dramas, well, not period dramas, but, yeah, well, those two, but also mm. when you just see, like, uh, people using computers in early 90s dramas and things, yeah. and you, you, know, you just remember the sheer bulk of space the, they used to the, take up. The, just the sheer immensity of the monitors. They were massive. Mm-hmm. They were absolutely massive. I mean, I, I, I have a massive soft spot for the Amiga. I think I always will. Yeah, well, I'll never, I'll certainly never ever appreciate. I mean, in, in a sense, I will never appreciate any gaming the way I did in the '90s, obviously because yeah. of age and because of experience. But I'd say my late '90s gaming experience is very different from my early '90s gaming experience, and it's it is partly because of my age at those yeah. two times. But it was just a different. It was, yeah, you know, it's kind of a, it's a cliche of. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, historiography in a way isn't it but that it, the wild west of such and such but it, it kind of was kind of you know? was yeah i mean as we said earlier there there was just no context for this stuff there was not like a history to build on so a lot of these video game developers they didn't know what they were doing mm-hmm. they were just experimenting wildly throwing stuff out there and it's so interesting having the necessary experience and context to appreciate the evolution of it all to, see, to be able to chart from, like, the roots of things like Prince of Persia and whatnot, right up to Tomb Raider, then from Tomb Raider up to Far Cry, and from Far Cry to whatever the hell is going on now, Dark Souls and whatnot. It's crazy, isn't it? Mm. It's a crazy thing. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, you've, you've certainly reminded me of many, many a thing that I thought I were buried securely yeah. in my subconscious, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I do enjoy now, of course, is the fact that these games do still exist out there in some form. I mean, you can go to YouTube, and if you type in Amiga Long Plays, you'll find hun- you'll find them all. You'll find pretty much everything that was ever on the Amiga. Um, and it's very interesting re-experiencing them. Uh, the Long Play of Harlequin that you can find on there, I would highly recommend. It's just a fascinating piece of work. Um, myth, history in the making, beautiful. Turrican 2, worth seeking out for the music alone. Mm. Brilliant music. Um, in fact, Chris Hulsbeck, uh, the composer, he still does interviews now about the experience. Because people remember it so well. Yeah, there's so many memorable like earworms in those things. Like you were mentioning Captain Planet. I'm going to go back and listen Planet, to that as well. Yeah. Well, the I, Captain I, I was... Planet one just... just chimes association for me it makes me feel like a kid again yeah 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 and no, a lot of them will take me right back i'm sure i was it was funny I, I i was saying you know a lot of this if we have any of the amiga magazines left and stuff at my mum's house they will be tucked away in the attic somewhere mm-hmm. but and i i'll go back and see them next time i see mum but um i um i remember that this isn't from the time but i remember pulling out an old amiga format magazine probably in about 2010 something mm-hmm. like that and reading it and it was i think they were reviewing a game that i've got in my notes here which is was called jaguar eraser uh, and it was, you know, it's a standard r- rally yeah. racing game, you know, as, as generic as anything that you get no. in the Amiga. <laughs> um, but, but I remember, because of course this is the thing that you've got to adjust your um, memory, um, obviously these were cutting edge graphics, as we've yeah. said, and this was cutting edge graphics for a radio, uh, for a racing game, you know, obviously beyond something like, you know, the, the sort of, um, what do you call it, the sort of uh, F-Zero, Mario Kart, things that of we get course, in the SNES, yeah. like um, I, which, you know, what they call mode seven graphics and things like that mm-hmm. but above that. But this is, I remember, so, so not from the time, but, but in 2010, I looked at this and they were rating the graphics and it was something like, like mind bendingly fast. Like yeah. these graphics will strip the paint right from your eyes. And like, you know, you'll have to uh-huh. like, batten, like fasten your seatbelt. You're not going <laughs> to believe the realistic environment. And I, I was looking at the screenshots. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, like how, how is this, you know, in my 2010 head, how is of this course. describing what I'm seeing here? You know? Context is everything, isn't it? You know, um, um, yeah, I remember descriptions of video games like that in, in the magazines. That, oh, you know, talking about how amazing the graphics were and how insanely technically brilliant it all was. And uh, yeah, I mean, looking at it now, obviously, very, very crude. But by God, that that the Amiga was just that good at the time. Mm. Well, there's an excitement to being a games fan, isn't there? You know, like, I mean, we talk about games journalism as being, you know, either sycophantic or truth-telling or whatever, mm-hmm. but the truth is all of it was quite hypey, wasn't it? You know, because oh, yeah. it was the, the fandom was like that. You know, it wasn't the same. I mean, obviously, film fandoms and TV fandoms exist, but they their reviews tend to be a bit more in depth and kind of, yeah. kind of you know, a bit, a bit actually examinatory, whereas a lot of this stuff, I'm not saying the journalism didn't, you know take on the games and, and assess them and everything mm-hmm. but but for the better ones it was it was like proclamations being read almost wasn't it it was like it was it was the excitement of every, you and all your mates and you know everyone that you knew was waiting for this stuff you know well was, i uh, mean i suppose in many respects because video games were such a new thing back then there was such a new medium the whole phenomena was exciting so one when one came along that was epoch making that redefined the zeitgeist, that actually established like new genres of video games even, like mm. Populous, for example. If you go back and read the reviews of Populous, it it was the first god sim. Mm-hmm. It, it actually created that subgenre, and the reviews are insane. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I can the, imagine. The reviews of Populous, the likes of Populous, SimCity, which was, of course, the first of the sim games back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Syndicate. Syndicate from Bullfrog on the Amiga was a, a phenomenon. I never played it myself, but it was one of those games that changed everything, by all accounts. Um, even smaller games like Robocod, for example. Do you ever play Robocod? We had. I, I, I was going to ca- catch you on that when you mentioned it before. Me and my brother ended up getting James Pond 2 uh, yeah. Robocod for the uh, Mega Drive. Oh, played. did you? Wow. Yeah. We, we had yeah. the Amiga version, and um, that was a, a really significant platformer on that game. Mm. Uh, on that uh, system. Um, because it was just really well done. It was beautiful, it was cutesy, it was fun, the levels were really various. Um, it was a pain. It was very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great. That's the, that's the sort of game I would have totally had patience for on the Amiga and wasn't yeah. looking for in the Mega Drive. 
Right, yeah, it's, it is not the kind of game I don't think that fits on consoles. It works really, really well on the Amiga. Yeah. But because you've got so many other types of platformer to compare it to on the Mega Drive and on the Super Nintendo, it doesn't necessarily stand up. Yeah, I mean, they were different worlds. You yeah, know, I mean, they, they, they really, I mean, we haven't got the scope to talk about that now, but, you know, it, it kind of, it, it they, they did, you know, they, they are obviously over-documented territory, but they, they, oh, the, yeah. way the, the way the the way SNES and Mega Drive in their own ways changed things, I'm they not were... saying that, I'm not saying that they, they would not have things over the Amiga. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not that kind of I mean, yeah. there, there were very rare occasions when something would make such a splash on the Amiga that it would be ported to the consoles. So things like Zool, Zool was ported to the consoles. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Chaos Engine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, remember that. Chaos Engine was like one of the biggest games on the Amiga and actually did really, really well on all the consoles as well. The Mega would Drive God, version... Would Gods have been ported? Was Gods, it? yes. Gods was yeah. ported. Um, the sequel, uh, Deliverance, was not um, for some reason. Um, what else would have been Lemming, ported? Lemmings got ported and was Lemmings is, to play on the consoles. Lemmings the may actually be one of the most ported games in existence. Hmm. There were ports of Lemmings. There are still ports of Lemmings now on some systems. So it is. It is. Yeah, Lemmings is everywhere. Mm. Everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> so, we, we talked. We talked a bit during our Gormagast episode, didn't we? About like, yeah, we could. We could do a, a whole podcast on the Lemmings series. Oh, and, Lemmings I think. Is, I think yeah. I've deliberately stayed away from it quite a bit during this recording, just in case we do. Just in case, yeah, absolutely. I could definitely do a whole, whole episode on Lemmings. Um, and I think people would really, really enjoy it. Quite frankly. It's such a such a good game. Mm. It's so yeah, it's, well it's, meaning. It, well, that, that really that really is creating a well. I'm, I'm good, saying creating a genre. I don't know if it created anything other than lemmings. That's really. the funny thing, isn't it? I mean, I don't think it did because like there is there isn't anything quite the same as lemmings. There's a few that try to emulate it. And yeah, we were talking about that, weren't we? Like you know, games that are essentially like kind of god sims, but also like save em ups. You know, it's yeah. kind of yeah. I come up blank, you know. Yeah, it's an odd one, isn't it? I mean, and the funny thing is, of course, like, the God Sim has, has gone away. Mm. It was a an established format of video games from Populous right up until the early 2000s, because, of course, you still had things like Black and White, which was a God Sim, you know? Mm. Um, and it just died. It's just gone away. You don't get them anymore. I the what same, that's about. I don't know. The same is also true of things like the RTS, the real-time strategy, which was also big on the Amiga. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that and that also is kind of um, a foundation of one of the more sort of traditional ideas of the kind of particularly like the sort of nerdy male gamer, isn't it? Is that Very kind of that so. kind of game? You know, it's the kind it's of a, it's the kind of game that Mark from Peep Show would play. You know? Very much so. They they're games that require a lot of input, a lot of patience, and a certain degree of investment. Um, they're not quite as action packed, you know, which is probably why they largely don't exist anymore. Mm. Which is a yeah, great well, shame. Yeah, although that that does sound a bit like we are being old men, isn't it? And sort there of saying, is... oh, you know, the kids today they mm. don't have the concentration, you know. Oh, there is an element of yeah, there is an element of like the old man about that, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I am not that kind of old man. I I think that the last generation of consoles, the the PS4, what was one of the best ever. Mm. I think some of the games that came out of that era, and certainly from the independent scene, you know, are some of the best that have ever been. You know, just absolutely beautiful pieces of work. Um, well, and I'm the, throwing myself fairly hellheartedly into the Nintendo Switch at the moment, so I'm yeah. not, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm basically a Nintendo head till I die, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah. within that, I'm at least trying to push forward a little bit. Absolutely. I, I embrace the new. That's definitely the true. I mean, um, some of my favorite games ever made have come out in the last few years. I mean, Bloodborne is one of my favorite games ever, ever created. I think it's as close to perfect as a game has gotten thus far. Um, there's a an independent game called Pathologic 2 doing the rounds, which is not perfect at all. In fact, it's powerfully imperfect, but it's also one of the best video games ever made. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I did a let's play of it for my channel. It's you know you know what it is. It's the great Russian novel of video games. Oh, I saw you talking about this. It sounded it sounded fascinating. Yeah, it, genu- I don't mean that sycophantically. It did sound. Uh, it, no. it really sounded like nothing I'd ever experienced before. Pathologic Two is as far in narrative terms beyond most other video games as, like, 
it's 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 hard to find an analog for to be perfectly honest it is a new thing mm. it does with narrative things that video games just don't and it's kind of exciting to know that we're still in a phase where video mm. games you know because because i was that that review of zelda from n64 magazine in the late 90s i dug that out the other day and you know ocarina of time came out and within three weeks of it coming out people were describing it literally and you know yep. a quote as the citizen kane of video games yeah or, you know the guernica of video games that's such a quote from it um but but you know obviously you can never map game development one-to-one onto no. the film industry or the tv industry or anything like that but or indeed the history of theater but mm-hmm. you but it's interesting that we're still in an age when these new genres or paradigms uh, or modes or innovations are bubbling to the surface. Maybe oh, not absolutely. all. Absolutely. You know, and maybe we're not living through a particularly. I don't know if we're. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you seem to think we're perhaps living through a particularly golden crop of them. You know? Yeah, and I mean, it does also depend on where you go, of course. So you, it's it is generally the case that the mainstream markets are slightly moribund at the moment they they are not as fertile or as imaginative as the independent scene but the independent scene is absolutely thriving mm-hmm. absolutely thriving there's some beautiful stuff out there and there are now means and markets by which the independent scene can reach people in mm. much easier than it has been for many 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 years indeed arguably since those early days of the uh, the bedroom coder that we were talking about earlier yeah yeah well i'll have to i'll have to have a look into some of that because uh this is really this is this is kind of definitely fired off some synapses that i've not been using yeah. much recently oh my god i mean well i mean recently i mean you know you, do, you know of the binding of isaac yeah yeah I've well they, that. that had an update recently repentance and it has been a phenomenon as the, as the game itself is, I mean, it's managed to cultivate a, a particular audience and culture, um, and the new update is doing gangbusters. It's all over the internet. It's everywhere. Uh, apparently, it's superb, and it's an independent game. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I just love the fact that the space for it, and that's what's happening at the moment. Funnily enough, it seems to be like analogous to what's happening in a lot of creative mediums at the moment. It's certainly true of literature. Yeah, yeah. It'll be, I mean, it'd be really interesting, won't it? I mean, as as with all these things, to uh, you know, the, the kids who are at the moment uh, seven, eight years old, mm-hmm. experiencing this video game environment as, as you know, natives to it, um, yeah. when they when they come to talk i don't know if podcasts will be a thing but you know when they come to talk in sort of you know nearly 30 years about about this era you know and then God, they have what will they be saying yeah it's so interesting so well, sort of I'm, half, I'm... half remembered introductions and glimpses and horrific uh, introductions and you know fascinated i am fascinated I, I i i want to know i want to know what their formative experiences are and what they're experiencing are they like sitting down and playing bloodborne when they're probably not supposed to um and stuff like that you know the the resident evil remake so they're sitting and playing the binding of isaac and undertale and stuff like that you know well it's fascinating my nephew's uh three nearly three now and mm. uh he my brother does have a ps4 in the house so it'd right. be really interesting to well uh, see how he starts picking that up and interacting yeah with it. oh my god that is so interesting i i, I love that I, that as a as a topic of of discussion and exploration you know formative input and experiences and how it shapes the nature of your imagination yeah it's fascinating to me yeah i'm gonna when he visits in the future i'm gonna have to get like a special n64 pad that's just for him to use so yeah. he doesn't wreck the analog stick you know ripes yeah <laughs> <laughs> not, not it could be much more wrecked <laughs> no right <laughs> Uh, I'll plan ahead. I'll plan ahead. Brilliant. No, that I mean, this has been fantastic. It's such you know, I don't I try not to linger over nostalgia too much. I which I believe what I mentioned in the the last podcast we did, because I do think there is there are particularly toxic strains of nostalgia. I do feel that are rather pervasive in uh in the UK at the moment in particular. Mm. But no, it's that. It's really interesting going back and re-exploring these formative conditions. I think nostalgia is, you know, if if you, I mean, everyone has different takes on this and different tolerances yeah. for it. But I, th- you know, and people see it as more noxious than others. I think the crucial thing is remembering that you can't go back. 
and that's kind it. of making a piece with that before you even start down the road really that's it isn't it and not just automatically assuming that because you have like a formative attachment to something that it is automatically superior they're just not i mean i'm well aware that the games i talked about here like the very first one wolf child for example the very first video game i ever played will always have an attachment to it it's not a very good game mm. not in any objective sense it's not a very good game like at all but but your adult head needs to sort of say that like express that doesn't it and yeah so then you can dive back in and that's sort of communicate it. with the child you know? that's exactly it and uh, i mean another thing that people often don't seem to understand is that you can acknowledge those flaws and those faults and still love a thing mm. it, you're not saying that it's terrible or that it's hideous or that it's awful um you are just acknowledging the flaws that exist and that's all Mm. yeah yeah amen yeah and i think that's a lovely note to end it on actually yeah, what do you well, say sounds good yeah that really was a, that was a th thorough thorough round of the houses there i think it yeah. really really was um thank you so so much once again david i really enjoyed that really <laughs> really enjoyed that is there anything you'd like to uh pimp out yeah i suppose so yeah let me uh let me wrap my brains for details um i <laughs> so i i i host a podcast called the escape goat podcast mm -hmm. and it's just about to record its 30th episode started doing it last year it's a general discussion show where i have guests on uh including george who's been absolutely on one of them. yes we discussed gorman ghast it was great fun yeah it was good and uh we're hoping to have some more guests on soon and what i'll do is i'll probably take a short break for that over the summer but then start a sort of nominal series two of that uh coming out later in the summer uh and you can find it at the escape group podcast uh, dot com it's a libs insight uh, but you can also get it on spotify apple podcasts and it has its own youtube channel uh and uh, yeah do dive in i think there's it's probably got to the stage where there's just about something for everyone now superb links below ladies and gents mm. links below you'll also i mean if you check out the escape ghost uh, goat podcast you'll find some familiar faces on there including kit power that's true yeah yeah, yeah. Got quite, a, quite, a, quite a host of guests and yeah kit power talking about some uh, uh, british 90s political tv dramas mm -hmm. so that's, uh, as he does uh, as he does, as he does <laughs> superbly, yeah. uh, oh no i should say you can, you can also get me personally on um uh, d underscore fagiani uh, on twitter links below links below uh as for myself ladies and gents it's the usual you can find me knocking about here on exaggerated elegy all sorts going on at the moment playing uh the remake of resident evil 3 at the moment which is great fun it's actually really really good fun uh you can find links to all of my published fiction on strangeplaygrounds.com Com. and if you want to chat you can find me over at twitter under enigmatic elegy uh thank you so much everyone for listening and david thank you once again thank you so much bye bye guys <laughs>